generation's final journey begins. That was the tagline for one Star Trek Nemesis, a 2002 film that was pitched as the final send-off for the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation, a series that had not only brought Star Trek back as a franchise to television, but became a classic of science fiction on its own terms, with an ensemble cast of iconic characters being one of the principal reasons why. While The Next Generation told intriguing, thoughtful stories that interrogated questions about the modern day through the metaphor of a hopeful future and a humanity that strove to be better, it was the crew of the sexy, sexy Enterprise D that made it feel human. They were the ones that showed that humanity had evolved, yet was not perfect, yet still pursued the best parts of ourselves and enabled those around them to do the same. And also, The Next Generation was a bit horny. They certainly are fit. They certainly are. Okay, it was a lot horny, mostly due to this guy right here. We stand. We stand, Riker. You are the heart in my day and the soul in my night. I don't think this is my style. Shut up, kid. But all of this was why Star Trek Nemesis was so disappointing. Despite giving us the bountiful joy that is the Remans, as well as a bald Tom Hardy in a goth latex suit, a gift that certainly will always keep on giving, Nemesis failed to capture what made the next generation great. Most of the scenes that were written and filmed for the movie that focused on the heart of the next generation, its characters, were left on the cutting room floor as deleted scenes. So the movie could instead focus on the big space battle, sacrificing character for spectacle. And it made us lose moments like this one devoting my life to Starfleet. Not marrying, having children. All the choices have led me here. The choices I have made have led me here as well, sir. This is the only home I have ever known. I cannot foresee a reason for leaving. Oh, Data, you never know what's over the horizon. I mean, come on, Picard and Data sharing a glass of wine? The movie also leaned heavily into some of the more tired, regressive, and frankly intensely problematic elements of the entire Next Generation era, such as Deanna Troy being sexually assaulted because the plot for some reason, and a lack of nuance surrounding its themes of nature versus nurture. These were issues not just present in Nemesis, but present throughout Star Trek The Next Generation, but even more heightened and focused on in this film. And they're issues that I spoke more about in one of my favorite videos that I've ever done, my Sex in Star Trek The Next Generation video, which you should totally check out. But in the end, Star Trek Nemesis was a sour note for The Next Generation to end on, a hordus fart of a finale that seemed undeserving of wrapping out such iconic and important and compelling characters. And the movie was also a box office flop, both due to its steep competition in the box office, as well as the franchise itself beginning to show signs of becoming thin, as it became more and more tied to retelling the story of its past, telling the same style of tale rather than looking forward to trying to do new things with the franchise. Between all of that and the cancellation of Star Trek Enterprise a couple of years later, it seemed that this was where Star Trek's future would end. Yet, yes I did throw Nemesis twice, Star Trek came back in 2009 on the big screen and a few years later on the small screen with Star Trek Discovery, leading to a flourishing franchise featuring numerous new entries. All that, with certainly bumps and missteps, has pushed the franchise forward in new ways, both in the stories it tells and who it allows to be part of those stories in true Trek tradition of both diversity and inclusion. Even Star Trek Picard, which featured the return of the wonderful Patrick Stewart to the role that made him iconic, seemed more interested in moving beyond the Trek of the past, with Patrick Stewart saying he wasn't interested in redoing The Next Generation. I was so stimulated by their ideas and by their, their lack of interest in wanting to recreate next generation, but rather to say the world has changed. And indeed, the, the universe of Star Trek 
has undergone significant change. The first two seasons of Picard stuck to that mandate, with a few returning faces from Star Trek of the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, characters such as Seven of Nine, Riker, Deanna Troy, Q, Data, Guinan, and Hugh, but these are all characters brought back in mostly minor ways that also had them moved forward from where we last saw them, rather than remain static or moving backwards. <laughs> That's unexpected. And while all this was great, at the end of the day though, it seemed like Nemesis was really going to be the end for the entire intrepid Next Generation crew. Though, thankfully not Tom Hardy's career. But, as it said in the tagline, it was just a generation's final journey beginning. It was announced during season two of Picard that not only would the entire main cast of Star Trek The Next Generation return for the third and final season of the series, but so too would many of those who worked behind the scenes on Star Trek The Next Generation itself. Most notably, however, 12 Monkeys showrunner Terry Metalis, who began his career as an associate producer and writer for Star Trek Voyager and Enterprise, who had returned to Star Trek as a producer for season two of Picard, would be the showrunner for season three. Yet, while other Star Trek that had been going on at the time, like Star Trek Strange New Worlds, for example, had been thriving critically and with fans, Picard Season 1, and especially Season 2, had been panned, even by fans like myself. And that's really saying something coming from me, because as an SJW CBS shill, I never critically analyze anything that comes out of the CBS Corporation. <laughs> Don't look at the time code. I need to make my videos shorter. Anyways, Star Trek Picard Season 3 had a tall order. It had to wrap out the next generation in a way that Nemesis never did, as well as end the series of Picard overall, while also staying within Star Trek has become now and not feel like the next generation season eight, while also crawling out of the negative perception Picard's first two seasons had garnered. Which is a lot to ask. It's like asking Janeway not to murder Tuvix. An almost impossible feat. Too soon? Doesn't anyone see that this is wrong? Too soon. Yet, it appears to have managed to do just that. Th this season of Picard, that is, not too big survival. That man is dead. He is very much dead. If you look at the reception from Trekkies online, though, season three of Picard has been universally praised, saying that this was a, quote, return to Trek. Even folks who had been heavily against all modern Star Trek, saying it was SJW woke scold nonsense, Alex Kurtzman ruining everything, seem to love this season of Picard. What they have done, I will quote Robert Meyer Burnett, are crimes against imagination. So if you haven't seen any Kurtzman Trek, you are much better off than anyone else. Because Picard season three is the goodbye to the next generation crew that we never thought we'd get. Uh, and I can easily say it's the best of the new Trek because... The, I mean, there's a giant chasm. There's this and shit. How could this season do the impossible, just as the Next Generation crew had always done? Did someone at CBS fuck a magic space ghost candle? Who's to say? But I think the answer lies in the phrase, return to Trek. Because what Trek is this season returning to, and from where is it coming from? And what does that mean for the future of the franchise as a whole? Personally, I have very complicated thoughts on this season of Star Trek Picard. There was so much that I love and adored, and yet there was also some stuff that I really struggled with, as well as some issues that I've had problems with in this entire modern era of Star Trek. So I want to review Star Trek Picard's final season and interrogate that phrase, return to Trek. In many ways, this final season of Star Trek Picard was about generations and what we give to the future, both in its actual plot and its themes, but also in what this show represents as a series. Terry Metalis himself was a member of the youngest generation of the older era of Star Trek, coming back to Star Trek to finish the work of what that era of Star Trek was trying to do, and yet trying to move it forward as well. He was part of the lost generation of Star Trek, if you will, of those years where Star Trek had gone away and become something new. And as a result, Picard season three feels like a season about what we pass on to the next generation. Our pains, our hopes, our mistakes and missteps, our legacies, and what we hope will move beyond us. So it's time to examine this final season of Star Trek Picard. So let's, you know, I'm gonna say it, engage.
Okay. Ha ha. Ha ha. Did it. Before we get to the Star Trek Picard of it all, let's talk about Gene Roddenberry's legacy. Specifically, his love of a more open future when it comes to sex and sexuality. Don't believe me on that? I literally did a whole three hour and a half video about it. Which is why I think that this video sponsor, Adam and Eve, is a perfect companion for this review. Can I do a sponsor transition or can I do a sponsor transition? I'm trans, we got transitions down. And then we make a big deal out of it and ruin the transition. Anyways, Adam and Eve is a fantastic sex toy company that I personally had experience with and I highly recommend their products. Seriously, they're so good they make Jad see a Dax blush. Am I getting anywhere with these Star Trek jokes? Is this a sex toy? Actually, no it's not. I don't want to false advertise. This is not a sex toy. But if you wish to get Adam and Eve's excellent products, they do also offer discreet shipping so that you don't have to have those embarrassing moments on the transporter pad, and 20% of their profits goes to fighting the spread of HIV around the world. So Beverly Crusher would be proud. I love you. <laughs> and if you want to try out their products, you can use the link and the code in the description below or the one on screen to get 50% off one item and free shipping. And they even have a 90 day no hassle return policy so you know you're not dealing with a Ferengi. So thank you to Adam and Eve for sponsoring this video and on with the review. Let's start with what I loved about this season, beyond, you know, all the new cosplay options. The first thing you notice about Star Trek Picard Season 3 is how wonderful it is to see the next generation characters back together again. Throughout the entire season, it's honestly just a joy to get these characters back again and interacting in new ways. And the show smartly starts off first and foremost with Riker and Picard. You really feel the evolution of these two's relationship. They're willing to banter back and forth and rib each other as friends. Give me one of those rigid, disapproving, sour expressions you're famous for. There it is. And this is something that you wouldn't have seen all the way back in the beginning days of the next generation when they were commander and captain. I have no problem with following any rules you lay down, short of compromising your safety. And you don't intend to back off from that position? No, sir. But now they're just equals and it feels glorious. And starting up the season showing us these two is an excellent choice as we've already briefly seen Riker and Picard interact with each other all the way back in season one of Picard. Thank you, Will. What for? Oh, for so many things. We have a basis for these two in the modern era and it allows the season to build upon this foundation. Instead of just having every Next Generation character pop up in the first episode, we smartly get to meet them individually throughout the season's 10 episodes, allowing each one of them to get room to breathe and feel significant. Commodore LaForge. Jordy. Yet even better, each character feels like they haven't been static in the 20 years that we haven't seen them, but moved forward. Take my silver fox daddy, Worf, who is now working with Starfleet Intelligence and has shifted his ideology from one of a warrior always ready to fight as we saw in The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, but now someone who prefers pacifism, but will use violence as he needs to. You should know that I now prefer pacifism to actual combat. Energize, or I'm gonna die. Beverly Crusher has also been outside of Starfleet working as a Doctor Without Borders for several years now. Jordy now runs the Fleet Museum and is a concerned parent of two Starfleet kids. Deanna Troy is alive. Oh, enjoying whiskey and cigars, are we? More on that later. And we even get Brent Spiner back, who has been involved in Picard since the start playing every new version of Soon, this time back as a new version of Data, combining elements of all the Soon androids from before. And he plays them all to a T. And more. <laughs> I am before. I'm soon. No. I am more. Every Next Generation character this season has all evolved forward in some way. And speaking of the Next Generation, there's also a love for the iconography of that series as well. The bridge design of this season of Picard evokes a lot of the Elkar systems from the Next Generation, even so much so that the end credits played off of it. 
We also get a ton of Easter eggs like things at the Fleet Museum and the Daystrom Institute, as well as all the sexy, sexy starships. This is my personal favorite, Kirk's Enterprise. And while certainly I understand and to a degree agree that all of this is member berries nostalgia wanking and saying, hey there, there's the thing that I remember, I believe in a show that's meant to be a TNG reunion season, some of that is warranted. And to a degree, it makes sense in universe. There would be a reverence that Starfleet characters have for the USS Enterprise A or the USS Defiant within the world of Star Trek that characters would express. Seeing it makes me feel. <coughs> You're not the only one, Data. It feels very Lower Dexian of them. Yet, even within some of these nostalgia moments, these references are often used to further character moments and character beats of the story being told at the moment. Such as when Seven of Nine looks at the USS Voyager and reminisces about her family that she found after being reclaimed from the Borg Collective. I was reborn there. She was my home. Her crew were my family. And now I'm... You're just trying to find another. Currently in this season of the show, Seven is adrift in her identity, both within Starfleet and in finding a new family, a new collective. But then you, you and Janeway convinced me to join Starfleet. I thought this could be the right path for me, I thought. Which she feels even more achingly when she looks on with nostalgia at Voyager, feeling like she can't go back to what she had then. Yet by the end of the season, Seven does manage to find that identity and sense of self by becoming the captain of the Titan, or the Enterprise G, because, you know, Seven's a G like that. And we also get little hints of this arc throughout the season with characters like Sydney being someone who specifically respected Seven as herself, allowing Seven to feel a sense of grounding and identity and family within her new Titan crew. One of the few ways my dad and I are alike, we have a hard time making friends. But when we do, we know their value. And this moment using the nostalgia of the USS Voyager is a great moment to highlight her character's arc and where she is at this point in the season, struggling with her own identity. Something that Seven has always struggled with since she was first introduced, back in Star Trek Voyager. I find myself constructing scenarios, considering alternative possibilities. And also, despite all this member Barry's TNG era love, there's also a little bit of a reverence too, in a fun way, with things like the recurring joke that Picard's Chateau Picard wine is not all that good. A Chateau Picard Bordeaux, which you said was too dry because your taste in wine is pedestrian at best. Definitely Picard. Kind of makes me uh, nervous to finally open this then. Yeah. But even this season's aesthetic and editing style is based in nostalgia in a fun way, with it mimicking Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan in its title sequence and opening credits, for example. And I get that all of this is fan service, but who among us didn't swoon a little bit seeing the Enterprise D bridge and its sexy carpets and... Oh, wood paneling. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Sorry, I was getting getting hot over the D. And I will make it a threesome. Do you even hear yourself? I should also go without saying that the set design this season was fantastic. I actually even got to talk to the art director for this season and coincidentally a former college friend of mine, Liz Klakowski, in an interview that I'll discuss at the end of this video. I hope you understand that probably till like the day you die, there will be people asking you questions about it. <laughs> I hope you understand. <laughs> yeah. No, I already know now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And hearing Majel Barrett, queen of Star Trek herself, as the voice of the computer one last time on Star Trek Picard. Shutdown procedure initiated. I miss that voice. Well, if you didn't tear up a little bit at that, what are you? A Cardassian? Wait, is that joke racist? Well, at least they didn't say the spoonhead slur. Oh wait, fuck. I will say some of the references go a little bit too far. I mean, we do see Seven of Nine at one point looking for a changeling's goo pot. Rest in a, in a, in a, in a pot, a vase, a receptacle thing. Sometimes 
And don't get me wrong, I love the goo pot. We stand the goo pot on this channel, but it makes zero sense. Why would a changeling have the exact same goo pot that Odo from Deep Space Nine used? And why would they reveal themselves in this way by having a goo pot that they hide in the walls? Why not just use like a, like a flower pot or something? It's a little bit of a stretch for me and it's seemingly only there to give Seven something to do for half an episode and to make a nostalgia, hey look, I remember that goo pot! And it stretches logic a little bit. And there's a couple of those throughout the season. But again, we stand the goo pot. I am here for the goo pot. Give me the goo pot spinoff, Paramount, you cowards! Honestly, the only fan service moment that really disappointed me was the appearance of Moriarty, as Moriarty, who appears in this season, is simply a recreation of the hologram a version of him, not the Moriarty that we met in TNG. It's just his aesthetic, not his actual character. The Moriarty from The Next Generation actually gained sentience and was trapped by Picard in a holographic hell thinking that he had escaped. Earnestly, I was hoping we get to see that Moriarty because that Moriarty had an interesting grievance with Picard and an intelligence to do something really clever. To be honest, he would have been a far more interesting and less fan servicey choice than the Borg as the ultimate final villain of the season. Beyond that though, the dynamics between our TNG cast members are also wonderfully expressed. It's not a nostalgia quip fest like Marvel movies, but genuine interactions between characters that we come to love. Would you like me to say something comforting? You might find that impossible. I know. Riker and Picard have heart to hearts and even at one point have conflict over how best to command. She doesn't know that we know that we're being tracked. I understand you're amped up, you have a son on board and it's affecting- Well, why? I'm taking the ship and her crew home. Worf and Riker take time to reintegrate into being friends again. I see you still find comfort in humor and humor in other people's discomfort. You used to poke back. What happened to you? Jordy gets to share and express his pain at having seen Data die in Star Trek Nemesis. He had broke me. <laughs> but see, you, you put me back together. You repaired me, the, the memory of you. Expressing their literal undying friendship. A friendship that the movie era of The Next Generation seemed to brush aside and forget in order to put Picard and Data together. So I'm glad that they finally actually got to have moments here. I hope that you can sense as fully as any human has ever felt anything, how happy I am to have my friend back. And Beverly and Deanna get to talk about something other than a man. It's ridiculous and wonderful. I feel completely out of control. Or their boobs. And have you noticed how your boobs have started to firm up? Not that we care about such things in this day and age. Uh-huh. At least for a single brief conversation. I even found myself talking to you on my darkest days. Well, on my happiest ones too. It turns out you give really good advice even when you're not there. So, you were always in my heart when it mattered. Do you think that Beverly and Troy did their calisthenics on the Titan before they went to fight the Borg at the end of the season? Also, the people behind Picard spent all that time and money remaking the Enterprise bridge set, but they didn't spend time making this set? I mean, come on, this is where the real nostalgia for TNG lies. I know all of us that are attracted to women watch that scene several times and have a lot of, let's just say, nostalgia for it. Speaking of dirty jokes. <coughs> this season also managed to move forward the next generation plot lines that had felt unresolved. For example, we get Data finally being able to confront his brother, Lore. While I was left abandoned, alone, you were showered with all the love and friendship the galaxy could offer. This season managed to give us a beautiful finale to a antagonistic relationship that has existed from the very first season of The Next Generation, with Lore being integrated into Data himself. He took the things that were me, and in doing so, you have become me. Becoming greater than the sum of all the soon's parts. Though while I did love the resolution to the story, it does tie into nostalgia a little bit regressively for my taste, as Data certainly is moving forward as a character, but it also serves to bring him back, undercutting his death in season one. The last time we spoke, you wished to experience death. As happy as I am that you're here, I hope that we haven't betrayed that wish. It's Data, even Brent Spiner again, but slightly different. 
He doesn't even become a new actor or get a new face. He's not something new like Soji, Data's daughter who represented this in the first season of Star Trek Picard. But even beyond all this, we even get a few non-Next Generation appearances too, with Tuvok from Star Trek Voyager coming on to speak to Seven of Nine. And he also is used to make a genuine moment relevant to this plot, not just nostalgia wanking, because we get to learn that he is actually a changeling in disguise, allowing our knowledge of Tuvok as a stoic Vulcan to become unnerving when we finally see him grin. This scene uses our nostalgia and a cameo to twist the knife and raise the stakes for the season as a whole. Speaking of, we also get that with the surprise appearance of my girl, Ro freaking Laren, another plot thread left dangling at the end of The Next Generation that I desperately wanted to see some sort of resolution of. At the end of The Next Generation, Ro had left Starfleet for the Maquis, leaving Picard feeling betrayed because he had worked so hard to help her feel accepted and move up within Starfleet. So when Picard meets Ro in this season, they have to confront each other and deal with this conflict. Or is this you turning your back on another institution? Save your animosity, Admiral. Yet even better, the resolution of this conflict is at odds with the tension of the story at that point in the season. Because we learn that Changelings, the villains of Deep Space Nine, have infiltrated Starfleet. So Picard needs to be able to work on trusting Ro, the person who betrayed him, at the exact moment when he doesn't know who he can trust. And the only way that they can end up trusting each other is if they resolve their pain. And as a result, Picard comes to understand that there is more to him beyond Starfleet. He had felt betrayed by Ro because he thought that he and Starfleet were the same thing. But Ro betrayed Starfleet, not Picard. As Ro says, I joined the Maquis because belonging there meant standing up to injustice, even if it meant betraying your beloved Starfleet. That was me. But you could never understand that because you confuse morality with duty, and that, Admiral, is your dishonor. And by accepting and understanding this resolution to their conflict, Picard learns that Starfleet is not the same as his own identity. He's finally able to start to separate the two's ideals, something that will play into his own relationship with his son, Jack Crusher, throughout the end of this season. Also, can we just appreciate for a moment the sheer fucking gall of Roe to put her spy shit within her Bajoran earring? Kai Wynn would not approve, and I love it. Yet the tension was amazing throughout the season with the changeling plot leading to a great conspiracy thriller vibe for this show in the middle of its run. A trust no one scenario that I always really love, especially how it's evoked in episode five of this season. It calls back to two of my favorite episodes of Deep Space Nine, Homefront and Paradise Lost. We're smarter than solids. We're better than you. And most importantly, we do not fear you the way you fear us. In the end, it's your fear that will destroy you. Are you finished? Finished? <laughs> We've barely begun. Speaking of changelings though, the changelings themselves are a storyline from Deep Space Nine, not the next generation. But one that actually for me works great here because along with the Voyager cameos, it allows this season to feel like an extension of the Star Trek universe from the 90s and 2000s, not just of the next generation itself. And the changeling plot feels like an evolution from where Deep Space Nine ended, not just doing the same thing. The Federation, through Section 31, attempted to genocide the Dominion at the end of Deep Space Nine, and the changelings and the Great Link only got the cure through the actions of Odo. The Dominion has spent the last two years trying to destroy the Federation, and now you're asking me to put our fate in their hands. Yes. I can't do that. I don't have your faith in the solids. But perhaps I could change your mind. If it hadn't been for that, the Dominion War would still probably be raging today, or the Federation would have even lost that war. So of course there would be resentments, pain, and trauma on both sides of that conflict. Which then of course ties back into this season of Picard's theme of one generation giving to the next, of what the past gives to the future, and how that's not always a good thing. This past trauma being brought into the present is most represented by Amanda Plummer playing Vatic for the first four fifths of the season. And Vatic is an amazing villain. She's not just chewing the scenery, but feasting on it. It's been centuries since timepieces last ran on the mechanics of gears, and yet that persistent sound you hear is the gentle tick tock of passing seconds. Yet her performance works so well because we learn that she is a changeling who never really got to hang out and learn how to be a solid, how to best mask as them. So her intonation and speech pattern are slightly off. There is a sizable bounty on his head, and we are taking him. 
It's just alien and weird, and I love it. She's a tremendous antagonist for the season, one who I think is sadly too often relegated to just talking to a room of faceless minions rather than to our other Star Trek Picard lead actors. It's a little bit disappointing because when she does get to bounce off of other actors, she shines. He's to play understanding ah. to your crew. I'm bored already. On top of all of this, the show does get to explore a few strange new worlds as well. We get to see Metallus Prime, the planet that was briefly mentioned in Star Trek Enterprise and named after Terry Metallus himself. I saw the ring moons of Metallus Prime. And it's a criminal underground world that Raffi and Worf explore to uncover information. And there's a lot of fun here on this planet that we get to see, such as meeting the best named Ferengi ever, Sneed. There's a redacted statement from a low-life Ferengi crime lord named Sneed. 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 Sneed and a Vulcan gangster, both characters played by 12 Monkeys alum. And while all of these are interesting and fun ideas, I will say I find them a bit surface level, unfortunately. Metallus Prime itself feels a bit cribbed from Blade Runner, and while the idea of a Vulcan crime boss is incredible, he mostly just says logical a bunch. That would be logical. We never really get a more profound sense of what his ideology of criminality is, using logic as his pathway to justify it. And Sneed is fun, but acts more like a crime boss with a Ferengi aesthetic, rather than playing off how we've seen the Ferengi be handled in previous seasons of Star Trek. We never even get to hear a rule of acquisition. I mean, come on, there's one right there for you. Ferengi rule of acquisition number 69 in negotiations. Never lose your head. Sorry, had to do it. It's not that these characters or situations are bad, but there's not a lot of depth to them beyond pasting a Star Trek aesthetic on top of a typical criminal underworld plot. It's just very paint by the numbers, except for now you get a Vulcan. If I were to improve this segment without changing the story, I'd say you'd either have to cut Sneed or the Vulcan and focus on one, so you'd have more time to flesh them out. Yet, there is some good story to be found in those scenes, because smartly, this season of Picard doesn't just rely on our nostalgia for the next generation, but mixes in our next generation crew members with new elements from modern Star Trek. This is most clearly evident between Michelle Hurd and Michael Dorn's platonic chemistry being off the charts this season. And I love Worf training Raffi as a warrior and teaching her the lessons that he learned between the time that we last saw him and now. Why do I do this? My life, my family, my sobriety. What is wrong with me? You almost died on a mission that everyone told you you should not work. Yeah, thanks. Patience, calm, and a tempered blade, both mind and body. It's a nice way to showcase how Worf has grown between when we last saw him, and also wrap out where Raffi has been going this entire series, struggling with her sense of identity and her lack of feeling control in the world around her, leading her to vices like drugs or toxic relationships like we see with Elnor in season two. It's so not the young man I see in front of me. But, but you know what? If that's what you want to do, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine, you know. I don't know. Hey, it's your life. By seeing her almost fall back into her old habits this season and feeling adrift, Worf, who is a character who also had the same sense of being adrift stemming from his isolation from Klingon culture all the way back in The Next Generation, is able to guide her through that journey by showing her how he found his own sense of self. Oh, also, random aside here though, because I didn't have anywhere else to put this in the script, why was Worf hitting on Troy all season and didn't have one mention of his wife, Jadzia? I have thought of your empathic gifts often during my self-evaluation. Well, that's wonderful. Inappropriate. Worf. The work that I've done on myself. My gal Jadzia did not get ragdolled by Gul Dukat to be disrespected by her widow like this. But moving on, we also have the USS Titan, where this season's actions mostly take place. And it's Captain Shaw, played by 12 Monkeys actor Todd Stashwick. Shaw is easily my favorite thing about this season, which is shocking considering he's a brand new character amongst legacy characters. Shaw initially comes across as a rude asshole to our legacy characters. I apologize, Captain. Are we late? Hardly. It's just your reputation preceded you so far into the room that I started early. Even more so and more personally, he seems to deny seeing Seven of Nine as a whole person as his first officer, resentful of her being ex-Borg, calling her Commander Hansen despite her name being Seven of Nine. Well, this is Seven of Nine. Commander Annika Hansen, sir. Captain Shaw prefers that I use Hansen. 
something that Picard himself recognizes. Thank you, Seven. And all of this should be stuff that makes us hate Shaw. Yet Tan Stashwick managed to give him a charm even within his dipshittery. I underestimated you. You have great instincts. You are a natural leader. Make a great captain one day. Which is something I totally would say. If you were a changeling and not just a dick. Now you're starting to catch on. And the show gives him a lot of nuance as well. We see him being a complete person, not a simple asshole or antagonist. Like when he nerds out at meeting Jordy. Uh, as a former engineer, I, I just wanted to say what a what an honor it is to have you on board. Captain, your hull is battered, bruised, and basically paper thin. You're spewing fumes through layers of 21st century duct tape. Yeah, it's been a weird week. There was nothing more relatable this season as a Trekkie than him just freaking out over Jordy. Which is why, under better circumstances, I would gladly geek out with you over the marvel of maintenance and engineering that this ship is. <laughs> And as the season goes by, we do see that there is a reason that he is a Starfleet captain. While he doesn't always agree with our lead characters, his opinions have validity. For example, he hesitates to rescue Picard and Riker from their situation in episode 2 because it would mean putting his crew on the Titan in danger in an area that they're not supposed to be in. If that ship decides to engage us, we are outgunned, and I am not going to risk 500 souls for two relics who think that a couple of brass medals make them golden boys. They dug their grave, they took you with them. Hold your position, LaForge. Yet he does choose to make the noble choice at the end of the day. And as the season goes along, we start to see why he's so protective of his crew and risk averse, while also having a stigma against Picard and Seven as ex-Borg. Because Shaw himself was at and was traumatized by Wolf 359, the Borg attack that Picard was forced to lead when he was assimilated by the Borg in Star Trek The Next Generation. We weren't. We didn't fight over who should live and who should die. No, we. We waited for orders, and then finally, some lieutenant comes down, and she just starts pointing. You, you, and you. She's pointing at me. Why, why me? Out of that experience, Shaw fears death and putting his young crew in danger. Yet what I love most about this season of the show is the nuance with which it shows his character, because while it understands his trauma, it holds him accountable for the actions he takes stemming from that trauma, like his mistreating Seven of Nine. Vincent LaForge always calls me Commander Seven. Out of respect. Good call. In the end, though, Shaw does ironically die at the hands of his young crew who have been turned into Borg despite his fears. And yet, he does shine through despite this, in his final moments calling Seven of Nine her actual name, seeing her full humanity. You have the card. Seven of Nine. It shows that he was not immovable and incapable of change, and it's a beautiful arc that showcases what Trek is always about. Not us being perfect humans, but living in a world that enables us to pursue our best parts of ourselves through empathizing with our pain and understanding our flaws, and thus being able to move beyond them and become greater as a result. My only knock against Shaw's storyline is that it does end on the tropey redemption through death, rather than actually have him be held accountable and showcase that we can work to do better day by day. But alas. However, while the relationships between Shaw and Seven or Raffi and Worf represent a middle generation having relationships between the TNG era and our younger generation today, the relationship between the oldest and youngest generations is the focus of this entire season. I grew up listening to your adventures. All the times you and Picard stood up for what was right. It's a different time. No, it is you and I that are different. This season is about, as I said, lineages and what we pass on. Someone will rise to be the best of us. And we see this most notably between Picard and his surprise son, Jack Crusher. Is there anybody you know who is still the person you knew? Or have you planted roots in your vineyard while everybody else moved on? Who is your father? I never had one! And I will say, the reveal that Picard had a secret son that he never knew about could have easily been a jump the shark moment. Surprise kids and family members are an overwrought trope, even within Star Trek, which already did the surprise family members, including Picard having a potential surprise son, all the way back several times in TNG's final seventh season. Your genetic code is a cross between the DNA of your mother, Miranda Vigo, and your father, Jean-Luc Picard.
<laughs> yeah, the revelation of Jack being Picard's son is sold entirely on the actor's performances and expressive writing. The scene between Beverly and Picard, where no words are said but Picard accepts and understands that Jack is his son, is a powerful acting moment that shows trust by Terry Metalis and the writers of the season to let their two seasoned actors with intense chemistry bring everything they need to the scene. And this is something that has followed up on in a brilliant conversation, which may be the strongest written and acted scenes of the entire series, where Picard and Beverly discuss Beverly's choice to not tell Picard about his son. Jean-Luc, when the galaxy comes calling for you, you are not put upon by it. You love it. Don't tell me you would have walked away. Beverly, you made the choice for me. You don't get to condemn people before the fact. And on top of that, the moments of bonding between Jack and Picard are deftly handled this season, showcasing a growing connection between these two characters that would ultimately become the emotional crux of the season finale. I mean, Picard shares how he almost died as a team because he wanted to get laid. No, borrow a shuttle to return to Argelius briefly to- Get laid? Hey, we had an invitation. <laughs> Truly a father-son bonding tale and Picard living up to Gene Roddenberry's very horny legacy. But the warmth and evolution of Picard as a character trying to reach out and understand Jack as a son, especially for a character who from the very first episode of The Next Generation said he never wanted kids. And I, uh, I don't feel comfortable with children. Is potent. You are the part of me that I never knew was missing. Picard never wanted to be a dad, and as a result, you can see this in Jack's reluctance to relate to Picard as a father, because he feels that Picard wouldn't really want to get to know him or see him as his son. We even see Jack at one point try to reach out and meet Picard, only to realize that Picard views Starfleet as his family. Going back to that same Roe versus Picard storyline that I talked about earlier, where Picard needs to realize that Starfleet and himself are not the same thing. What about a, a real family? Young man, Starfleet has been the only family I have ever needed. But as the season goes on, Picard begins to hear and relate to his son and his struggles, and Picard begins to see what he was missing as a father. The joy and lessons that he could have passed on, or the guidance that he has to give. I lived with Eremodic Syndrome for decades. Fate is a way of surprising us, and you're young, Jack. Yet at the same time, part of what makes Picard hesitant is what he fears that he could give Jack, his pain and trauma, the worst parts of himself, a fear that every father or parent has. He inherited the best of you and the worst of me. And this is symbolized by the reveal of the season's end villain, the Borg. We learn that Jack has felt something inside of him his whole life, a desire for connection. A life of... This connection only to realize that I'm emblematic of war. A bee seeking a hive for, for a collective, for a queen. And that is the Borg inside of him now. We ultimately learn that Picard passed on part of his Borg traits to his son. A seed, something I passed on to you. The idea that Picard has Borg sperm is hilariously dumb. I mean, the idea that in the episode The Best of Both Worlds, where Picard was assimilated, that it was a top priority for the Borg to give Picard some Borg sperm, or at the very least some organic components, as the season says, is hilarious. Give this the cutest man some nano juice, juice now, if you know what I mean. Stacked. What are the Borg run by Gene Roddenberry? But that being said, Star Trek has always had silly dumb stuff that is often used to get to more exciting stories. I mean, what are the Frankie if not ridiculous? Yet they provided some of the franchise's best content. How can you not love my adorable Rom or Nog or everyone's favorite sexist capitalist goblin quark? If you drink enough of it, you begin to like it. It's insidious. So I'm willing to accept dumb, silly stuff in Star Trek. In fact, I love when Star Trek does dumb, silly stuff. And while I have more extensive criticisms of how the Borg are used later on in this video, between Jack and Picard, it actually works really well. Out of his fear of passing on his trauma, Picard turns Jack down when Jack tries to reach out to and finally express his Borg heritage to him. It's an institution, a prison where they can mind meld and lobotomize the Borg from me. No thanks. Uh, this is my problem and I can handle it myself. He comes across in a scene like a gay son coming out to his father who rejects him. And then Jack runs away when his dad is unsupportive. 
Picard can't see Jack for who he is because Picard himself is wrapped up in his own bullshit. Yet eventually Picard confronts his trauma by rejoining the Borg Collective to get his son back. But not now. Now I have something to go back for. Stop! And what's even more beautiful about these scenes is that while Picard tries to turn Jack away from the Borg, he ultimately accepts Jack's choices for his own sake. He doesn't try to force Jack to leave the Collective. He says, well, I'll stay with you if this is what you want, allowing Jack to feel a sense of acceptance from his father. Then if you won't leave, I'll stay with you. Till the end. Which is ultimately what allows Jack to return to himself. It's love, acceptance, and seeing someone as their whole self in the face of the Borg control or the Borg Queen's fascistic appeal of giving yourself up for a larger collective that doesn't care for you that allows Jack to feel like he can escape and feel acceptance. It's ultimately a really beautiful storyline and one that I think caps off this season really emotionally well. And from all of this, I hope you can see that there is a ton that I loved about this season of Star Trek Picard, especially as a show about passing the torch from one generation to the next one, appropriate given the show being a wrap out of the next generation. But all that being said, however, as this season came to an end and I got to see the whole picture of what this season was, I started to, like Deanna, sense something that bothered me. And I think my discomfort lies right at the heart of that idea about what we give to those who come after us from what we've made for ourselves and what lies ahead for those who carry on our legacy. This section of the video is going to be my critiques and criticisms. And a lot of my issues with this season come down to perspective, whose perspective the story is told through. But let me first start off with the more structural criticisms of the season, of which many I would apply not just to this season of Star Trek Picard, but to a lot of modern Star Trek generally. First and foremost, let's address the big Borg cube in the room. The time and place that the Borg are brought into this story feels way off. It's revealed literally in the last two episodes of the season and feels like a complete shift away from the story that we've been telling with the Changelings. And this goes to a major issue of this season, pacing. Pacing has been a huge problem of every season of Star Trek Picard, as well as Star Trek Discovery. For both shows who are telling serialized stories throughout their entire seasons, the pacing continually feels off. They often have these big mystery box storylines and then string them along for most of the season. And it means that whatever the reveal at the end of the season ends up being, it needs to be good because it's been strung out over 13 or 10 episodes. And honestly, it never really is worth the wait. No! No! That's not to say these big reveals are bad. I'm actually one of those weirdos that actually likes the revelations at the end of Star Trek Discovery season three and four, but they're very underwhelming compared to all the buildup and it makes people feel incredibly frustrated as a result. Now, to be fair, Picard season three is a bit better about this on the surface as there are at least hints about the Borg coming in the finale weave throughout the season. Like Jack listening to his father's captain's log from best of both worlds in the first scene of the season, or the discussion of Wolf 359 with Shaw, or the fact that the weird goo head that Vatic talks to is clearly the Borg queen. So this reveal of the Borg is much better led into and the groundwork is slightly better laid, but it makes the reveal that much worse that it happens so much later. And it's just a continued recurring issue that Star Trek does not seem to be able to do serialized stories really well, at least in live action. Star Trek Prodigy does actually do a serialized storyline very well, in my opinion. Speaking of finales though, this season continues my issue that I've had with a lot of Star Trek finales in this modern era, especially in live action, in that they always need to crank everything up to 11. Every season of Picard and Discovery have always ended with the fate of the Earth, the entire Federation, and potentially all life in the galaxy at stake. And it honestly just makes things feel like white noise. They are gathering forces to launch a strike on full system. And what is that outcome? A future in which all sentient life in our galaxy has been eradicated. It's to seek out advanced synthetic life and excise it from the oppression by organics. You will become the destroyer after all. Another burn could destroy what remains of the Federation. If we want to save the future, then we have to repair the past. Otherwise, it will destroy our planets as well. And billions will die. 
makes me lose interest if the stakes are always world ending every single time. And not only the stakes that, but also everything needs to be at that 11 scale. For example, we learn that it's not just a lot of Starfleet ships that are at Earth attacking it, but every single ship in the fleet. Does every ship in Starfleet operate as one? It can't just be a few ships, it has to be every single one, apparently. Not only is that logistically weird, you're telling me Starfleet would call back every single ship just to be at Earth for Frontier Day? But it also creates plot hole problems. I mean, what happened to that copy and paste fleet that we saw from Star Trek Picard season one? Did they all just disappear within the last few years? Also, where the hell are my California classes? My beautiful, sexy Cerritos. Where are my handsome ladies? Uh, the Cerritos is a handsome lady. You're damn right about that, Boiler. My inner ship lover and occasional friends with benefits needs to know. Did I just say too much? I like it when things are much smaller scale and the stakes feel much more relatable. Like my favorite action focused episodes of Star Trek are ones like Memento Mori of Strange New Worlds or the Lower Deck season one finale or Balance of Terror from the original series where it's just a few ships fighting each other. It makes everything feel much more relatable rather than blockbuster and white noisy. But then we get to the Borg Queen and honestly it's great to have Alex Krieg back as the voice of the Borg Queen. I adore her from First Contact and her finale in Voyager. But still, I think I should add your biological distinctiveness to our own. It's kind of our thing. But that being said, she and the Borg are the most fan service villains this show could have picked to wrap out this season and series on, especially for the Next Generation crew. Resistance is futile. To be fair, they are Picard's and the Next Generation's most prominent villains, so it feels somewhat appropriate to end on them, but both season one and two of the series, despite their flaws, I felt that did at least a worthwhile job of having the character Picard confronting and resolving his fears when it came to the Borg. At the very least, this is a slightly different Borg, as now Picard is actually engaging the actual collective, which at least feels like it's a culmination of Picard's learning from seasons one and two of this series. In season one, he learned that ex-Borg, like himself in Seven of Nine, are actually victims of the Borg. After all these years, you're showing what the Borg are underneath the victims. And in season two, we learned that the Borg can become something new, like Jurati Borg. Somebody who used her Borg half to serve the best of her humanity. Let's build a universe of sevens. It was just the Borg Queen and the way the Borg were depicted in their previous appearances with their fascistic ideals who are the bad ones. And so Picard can take the learnings from seasons one and two to confront this villain in a new way with new information and new growth as a character. But this also does bring up some problematic questions like what happened to the Singularity, the evolved Borg at the end of season two with Jurati, or Borgrati as they say, and her vagina Borg ship. Yes, it does look like a vagina. I get that Borgrati is a sort of separate collective from the Borg Queen, but it's still weird that she never comes in here. Even more so, this plays into another issue that I have with season three, in that it seems to deny a lot of what happened in season one and two of this very series. So much of season three tries to erase prior plot points of seasons one and two. Forget about all that weird shit of the Stargazer. And don't get me wrong, I dislike season two of Picard and I have major issues with season one of Picard despite liking a lot of its ideas, but it's weird to erase a lot of what those seasons did, what this very series did. For example, outside of Raffi, no Star Trek Picard specific characters appear in this season. Where are Elnor and Soji? They would have been perfect characters to bring in. Why not bring in Elnor as a crew member on the Titan? He's a character who got to see Picard as a father figure in a way that Jack never did and might have had interesting conflict with Jack Crusher as a character. Also, Soji is literally Data's daughter and he never even seems to ask or talk about her. Yes, apparently Terry Metalis in an AMA said that they did write a scene for Soji and they couldn't film it because of budget, but it's still weird that they don't at least have him mention her. That would have cost zero money. Unless, you know, you're paying Brent Spiner by the word. Wait, is that the reason that Data doesn't say contractions anymore because Brent Spiner wanted more money per word? You just used a contraction. No, I didn't. Obviously not but it's funny. Regardless though, to be fair, no one in Star Trek Beyond Cisco is ever going to win Father of the Year. I mean, where the fuck is Alexander Worf? I wasn't the kind of son you wanted, so you pretended that you had no son. You never accepted me. You abandoned me. But even beyond this Laris, 
apparently Picard's fiance is mentioned in the premiere and then never comes up again. There is this great bar in Channel Talk 4. You can watch the sunset from it. So I'll save you a seat. She's not even mentioned in the finale. Do you think she's just like waiting there for Picard to show up? Picard's like, oh shit, I forgot my fiance. Well, come on, Jack, time to meet your stepmom. And on top of all of this, there are numerous lines and jokes that make fun of past seasons. I thought you loved it. No, we went there for that, but it's not really my cup of tea. Honey, it's not mine either. That house, it's like it was designed by a cabal of retro prairie hipsters. And again, do not get me wrong, there's plenty to make fun of with Picard seasons one and two. I mean, Narek, just, just Narek. Just saying Narek is a joke in and of itself. But that being said, like or dislike these elements, and believe me, you can dislike them, these elements of Picard were trying something new and had kernels of good ideas in them. And Star Trek has always been about taking flawed stuff and doing really cool new things with those pieces. Again, see the Ferengi or the space slugs of the Trill, but instead Picard kind of pushes them aside and ignores them, and instead just wants to do all the nostalgia stuff with the TNG characters. Instead of seeing how these TNG characters relate to the new things from past seasons of Picard, outside of Raffi and a couple references. Hell, even Q's death from season two is undone, which feels really weird. I thought you were dead. Uh oh, and here I was hoping the next generation wouldn't think so linearly. But this brings us back to the Borg Queen, a very next generation and Voyager element. And here's my issue with the way the Queen is depicted in this season. Many people dislike the Borg Queen because it makes the Borg have a centralized villain. The threat of the Borg, when you have the Queen, becomes less of this immense and unknowable alien eldritch horror threat that they were introduced as way back in Star Trek The Next Generation seasons two and three, with them being more the, maybe they'll assimilate you, maybe they'll step on you like ants, maybe they'll ignore you terror. It's not safe out here. It's wondrous, with treasures to satiate desires both subtle and gross. But it's not for the timid. And reduces them in some people's eyes to scary monster woman with the ability to make people her own personal RC car units. But that's not a problem of Picard. It's been an issue of the Queen since you first appeared in First Contact and then on into Voyager. But for me, I actually don't mind the Borg Queen as an element if she's used in a very particular way. Because by having the Queen, it makes the Borg less a metaphor for natural disaster or something like that, and more of a metaphor for fascism, totalitarianism, or authoritarianism. But again, this requires her to be used in a very particular way. The Queen in past Star Trek series has been shown to view the Borg drones around her as an extension of herself. Take for example, the two-part episode Unimatrix Zero in Star Trek Voyager. Not a great episode by any means, but it did show that the Queen only saw drones as more of an arm or a leg of her collective body. Sphere 878, compliment. 11,000 drones, only one is silent. But I have no choice. I must silence all of them. I know how this must upset you, Captain. As a Starfleet officer, you value all life, even drones. How many more are you willing to sacrifice? She's willing to, in her mind, blow up an entire Borg cube because one Borg drone on it was infected, like cutting off a dead fingernail. But instead of going with that feel, the finale kind of goes with the queen being this crazy and traumatized mother who wants to kill others because her children were murdered by Janeway at the end of Star Trek Voyager. I have only my words. We are the future. And the soft assurances of a mother's love. To inflict death upon her enemies out of a mother's pain that she has sort of a personal investment in the Borg drones, less as sort of extensions of herself and more of entities on their own merits that she is upset for. And again, coded in a very feminine mother way. And this is fine to a degree, it works, but I'm somewhat uncomfortable with it given how we've seen motherhood depicted throughout the rest of this season of Star Trek Picard. 
Throughout the season, motherhood actually plays a very large role. We have Deanna, Beverly, and Raffi, for example. Deanna's story is actually very similar to the Queen's. We learn that after Deanna's son's death, as we saw referenced in Star Trek Picard season one, both Deanna and her husband, Will Riker, felt so much grief as you understandably would as parents. Yet Deanna, as a telepath, felt so much grief coming from her husband, Riker, that she decided to use her telepathic powers to take Will's grief from him and erase Will's own emotions. It was my last connection to him. And you tried to erase it. Not erase it. Take it. Help you carry it. But I forgot the one thing that all counselors should remember. You can't skip to the end of healing. As a result, it frames Deanna's grief as a mother coming out in ways that are trying to control others and control specifically men and fathers around her. Like the Queen, Deanna's motherhood is coded as controlling, traumatizing, and overly emotional. Beverly Crusher, whose storyline this season mainly centers again around her being a mother, does something kind of similar, though to a lesser degree. Out of fear for Picard's lifestyle, as a mother, Beverly takes away Picard's agency and ability to choose to be a father from him. When Jack was on his way, I was terrified. All I knew was that if you're the son of Jean-Luc Picard, there's a target on your back. I lost my parents, then a husband, then my son Wesley, all to the same stars that own you. As a mother, your whole being is about protecting your child. That's literally Beverly's whole arc this season, and. Honestly, after that moment, Beverly doesn't really get much to do other than to be stuck in the role that she was stuck in back throughout Next Generation, simply as the doctor giving exposition. So she's cast back again into that feminine coded role. But moving back, motherhood throughout this season is often seen as being one of taking agency away from fathers and men out of the women being overly emotional or concerned. Raffi, to a degree, complicates this reading, but her storyline as a mother is only in one scene of the series. And that scene itself is framed around Raffi being forced to make a choice between being a good mother or being a good Starfleet officer, and not being able to be both. I could talk to Gabe. Or I'll talk to Steve, but I would not do both. Right here. Right now. Make a choice. And it frames parenthood and professional life outside of the home as a mother as incompatible, which is a common trope that we see sometimes in media of reinforcing women's roles as being in the home, and incompatible with being able to lead a professional life at the same time. If we contrast this to fatherhood as depicted throughout of Star Trek and even within Star Trek Picard, fathers are able to have both a professional and a fatherhood life at the same time. All of this is a constant reinforcement of mothers going crazy in grief, which is a common sexist trope that we've even seen being reused today in shows like WandaVision, which was problematic even there, and fatherhood being at odds and restricted by motherhood. Mothers keeping men and fathers back. It fits these dated tropes around women being overly emotional, only defined by their fears and worry for children, being hysterical, or making poor choices if they suffer trauma while the men are able to suck it up. It's not a problem for women to have that storyline. It does happen, and it's a fine storyline to tell. It's a problem that only women get put in these stories and get put in it repeatedly within the same series and within the larger context of our culture. On top of all of this, there's a devaluation of motherhood within the narrative. Take, for example, how Jordi LaForge's kids never bring up their mother or even mention her despite all the stuff going on. Or more relevantly, take how the season finale narratively frames Jack accepting Picard as his father figure as him finally coming to feel less alone, which totally forgets that he had Beverly Crusher his entire life. Yet Picard, the man who he's only known for a few days at this point, is framed as more narratively important to Jack than his own mother. You have changed my life. Forever. Now, to a degree, this is an inherited problem from Star Trek The Next Generation. If you're going to do a Next Generation reunion show, it's hard because both Crusher and Troy were cast in that series in the caregiving roles as both doctor and counselor. And this season attempts to update them with Crusher being a doctor without borders and getting to shoot a gun a little bit and saying screw Starfleet, and Troy briefly getting to be an investigative therapist. But that all feels superficial. Like yes, Beverly gets to shoot a gun, but it's only in one scene and the strong female character 
character, hey, look, we made her be all tough and stuff, is ultimately undone by Beverly just being cast back in the Doctor role and not having much to do as a character for the rest of the season. And this issue of putting the women characters into more feminine caregiving coded roles is compounded by this season bringing back two of the more prominent women characters from the next generation who broke those stereotypical molds for women at the time and who actually stood up for Picard and Riker and seemed to have ambition in the careers, Shelby and Roe, only to have them both killed. Both Shelby and Roe in The Next Generation were two women who were not villainized yet were at odds with our leading men. May I speak frankly, sir? By all means. You're in my way. Really? All you know how to do is play it safe. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man for as long as you have, passing up one command after another. But unfortunately, they just come back this season and just get murdered. Roe's death at least feels somewhat earned and actually builds upon the stakes of the season. I'm giving you what you gave me all those years ago. A fighting chance. But Shelby is just quickly brought back, made to look ignorant for the very thing that she was constantly vigilant against, the Borg. The irony of her endorsing something so Borg-like. Happy Frontier Day, everyone. And then the season kills her without much fanfare. At least she got to talk about Star Trek Enterprise for a minute. 250 years ago today, the Enterprise NX-01, the first Warp 5 capable vessel to be constructed by human hands, made its maiden voyage. And then all of these issues about how motherhood and femininity is displayed in the season is subtly underscored by the brief visual mention of Tasha Yar, another headstrong woman who broke the mold for women characters from the next generation who herself was killed off because the actress realized that the writers didn't have anything for her to do because she was a woman who broke the mold of a woman character at the time that the show was written. Struggled with the whole writing of my character of Tasha Yar. They had a great idea that they didn't really know what to do with it. Ah, oh, God, Tashi Har. She deserves so much better than be killed by gooey McGoo man face douche than have a Windows XP funeral. And I've been making jokes about this this entire video, but it does kind of subtly bother me that Worf's wife from Deep Space Nine, Jetsia Dax, is never mentioned this entire season, while Worf also makes jokes about Deanna Troy when Jetsia Dax herself was a strong, nuanced female character who was killed off in Deep Space Nine's sixth season because of the behind the scenes treatment of actress Terry Farrell on Deep Space Nine by Paramount amount executives who didn't wish to pay her enough, as well as her treatment by franchise executive producer Rick Berman, and Deep Space Nine showrunner Ira Stephen Bear's ignorance of this whole state of affairs until Terry had already chosen to leave. What I didn't appreciate was somebody not talking to me. And I really felt like it was important to be heard. If you think I'm valuable, how come I'm not being listened to? I remember distinctly you know one meeting where she came into my office and and was crying and she felt that there were opportunities for her in network shows and she said i just want out i didn't want to die but there was a point where it was like you know what don't dismiss me talk to me and on top of all this raffi herself as a woman character isn't given much to do in the second half of the season either and so going back to the Borg Queen and all of this context fits this idea of femininity being framed as monstrous, devalued, and hyper-emotional. Which is a nuance I think that could have been fixed by having the Borg Queen speak less as a mother upset about losing her kids, and maybe more as a parent who only views her kids as meant to carry out her legacy, who is angry about the great work that her children were supposed to carry out for her that wasn't completed. But instead it frames the Borg Queen more as a traumatized mother. Also, random aside, if you don't buy my reading of the Borg Queen as a sort of feminine coded fascist character and want me to present more additional materials for you as evidence, I'd recommend checking out this Star Trek comic that I've had in this background the whole time called Hive. Because there's a lot of the Borg Queen in this comic as being framed as a feminine coded mother and fascist. And before all of you say, hey, Jesse, that's a comic book. It's beta canon. It's not really relevant to the conversation going on here. I'd say reread it again and say, huh, doesn't the plot of this comic seem oddly familiar? I mean, look at the queen in these two images. And then go and check who wrote this comic. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I'd go and check and see who the author of this comic book is. I am Locutus. Of Borg. Resistance is futile. Your life as it has been is over. 
familiar with physical forms of pleasure. Hair, garments, but at the core, you are still mine. You can feel their distinctiveness coursing through us. What you have just done here is more difficult and vastly more dangerous than you realize. And what is that? You've impressed me. You and I don't need words to understand each other. Was that good for you? It must be something you assimilated. But that leads me to my next issue with this season, and that's queerness. First and foremost, the literal depiction of queerness throughout the season has been very disappointing and downplayed in my mind. And we can see this very clearly with the characters of Seven and Raffi. Seven and Raffi have continually been an increasingly frustrating queer couple in terms of how they're written throughout this series. At the end of season one, we showcased them flirting, which was meant to signal that these two were going to get together in season two. Not only was this relationship confirmed by interviews with the showrunner, but also one of the showrunners herself, Kirsten Beyer, wrote an audio drama that took place between seasons one and two where they were together. And it's a very steamy audio drama. You should check it out. It's it's absolutely fan frickin' tastic. Okay, my turn. That wasn't my question. Mm, it ended with a question mark. Your voice lilted. Oh, come on. <laughs> Plus, I already gave you a pass on the replicator question. <sighs> Fine. First kiss. Before or after I was severed from the collective? Wait. The Borg have sex? Uh, two questions. You lilted. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Yet, season two then starts with the characters having already been broken up, and we spend the entirety of season two working to have these two earn getting back together. So at the end of season two, finally, we have Seven and Raffi being an on-screen queer couple. So if that's your kid. And then in season three, they're broken up in X's again. In fact, Seven and Raffi never have an on-screen moment together until episode six, where we're shown that they only have like awkward interactions together and we only get one explicit reference to their relationship with Worf joking about them being exes. I have gone into battle with lovers countless times. It can be therapeutic. I'm not going. That is a relief. I was practicing deceit. Guess Worf is scared of bisexual women. Or maybe he's just trans and homophobic. They bother me. Why Worf? Well, they just do. They're all alike. No males, no females. Yeah, yeah, that checks out. Worf, my boy, you got shit to work on. Still a sexy silver fox, though. They look like dresses. That is an incredibly outmoded and sexist attitude. I'm surprised at you. Besides, you look good in a dress. Anyways, I understand Shorn and Terry Metalis wanted to tell a story that required Seven and Raffi to be in different locations this season, but that doesn't require that they break up. Yet in an AMA, Terry also discussed that part of the justification he had for them breaking up at the beginning of the season is that they would end the season being captain and first officer of the Enterprise G. I think Starfleet regulations have a lot to say about them being officially together, which is why we had them apart to begin with. We knew we were ending here, and that would be a big conflict of interest on the bridge. 
I have criticisms with this justification on a couple different levels. The first one is that it kind of is the writers working backwards to figure out where they need to start instead of earning that naturally between the characters. Like I think it would have been much more worthwhile to have Seven and Raffi have an on-screen conversation about whether or not they could continue their relationship if they both were in Starfleet. Like even if you wanted to have them break up at the start of the season, even have an on-screen conversation where they talk about that decision, like maybe one of them disagreed with that line of thought for some reason, just something. But instead we get nothing between these two characters who were ostensibly in a relationship and it leaves us who wanted to see them actually finally earn being in a relationship after the end of season two feeling entirely frustrated. These two were partners and you're telling me they would have no interaction with any emotional depth this season? I mean Raffi has a more on-screen emotional scene with her ex-husband who isn't even a main character of this show than she does with the character who has ostensibly been her romantic partner throughout the entirety of this series. I mean, hell, we get more emotional queer scenes between Seven and Raffi in the audio drama, which again, I cannot stress again how good the audio drama is, than we get between these characters who have had literal seasons of build up to their relationship get on screen. And the very fact that this season continually chooses not to showcase these two queer characters' relationship, or even dramatize their breakup, which is relegated to in between seasons twice, showcases to me how little the show values its queer characters' identity. And this is even more compounded by the fact that Terry's reasoning is that Starfleet would apparently have regulations against them being in interpersonal relationships, which I disagree with at all. I mean, Starfleet has always been fine with interpersonal relationships. I mean, take Riker and Troy, Worf and Jadzia, who he apparently forgot, Bellana and Tom Paris, T'Pol and Trip, Culber and Stamets, Spock and Uhura, O'Brien and Bashir. Okay, not, not really that last one, but. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, maybe, maybe you do a bit more. What? Are you crazy? She's my wife. I love her. Of course you love her. She's your wife. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe you like me a bit more, that's all. Kind of that last one. Not to mention, this season itself references Worf and Troy being together numerous times, and also the fact that this season confirms and is expressly about Picard and Crusher having had an on-again, off-again relationship during The Next Generation. We ended our relationship. Our romantic relationship for the, the fifth time. Not to mention that Beverly Crusher herself and her husband, Jack Crusher, whom Picard's kid is named after, were also two Starfleet officers in a relationship. So to use the regulations as a reason to break up Seven and Raffi feels like it's them hyper-scrutinizing a queer relationship. This is not me saying that Terry Metalis or the writers of this season were hating on a queer couple and wanted to break them up, but me more saying that they might have been over-scrutinizing a queer relationship because they are more hyper-aware of it because it was queer than they would have been over a more naturalized and normalized steaming straight relationship. This is even more of a problem when you see how many straight passing relationships we see this season. We get hinted at romantic scenes between Jack and Sydney. Is he flirting? Those eyes. He is charming. And we also get to see straight passing relationships of past series like Riker and Troy. We get more with those couples than the Cillin who has been a significant plotline for the series for two seasons. Also speaking of Seven, it does kind of bother me that Seven of Nine doesn't get a moment with the Borg Queen in the finale either, because I'd argue that Seven had just as, if not more of, a relationship with the Borg Queen as we saw in Star Trek Voyager. You're torn between your desire to be one with us and your loyalty to them. It's time for you to complete your task. And so deserve to also have a final confrontation moment with her with Picard. But we never even get a sense that Seven of Nine even cares about the Borg all that much in the final two episodes. She's more just dealing with the situation at hand. She never even gets to relate to Picard about the Borg as she so wonderfully did in season one of Picard. After they brought you back from your time in the Collective, do you honestly feel that you regained your humanity? Yes. All of it. No. But we're both working on it, aren't we? And moving to other issues with queerness, we also see characters like the non-binary character this season as a side alien bridge character, which again casts trans people only in alien metaphor and as background players, which is an issue that science fiction and, you know, Hollywood generally has had when it's come to representing queer and trans folks, but even Star Trek specifically has had an issue of. Going all the way back to Star Trek The Next Generation episodes like The Outcast or Cogenitor on Star Trek Enterprise in 2002. You've heard of these cogenitors. 
not all species are limited to two sexes. <laughs> and it's frustrating that that idea of trans and non-binary people being alien metaphor and side characters is compounded here, especially since Star Trek has been moving forward in this area for a long time. Star Trek Discovery and Prodigy have non-binary main characters, and Strange New Worlds featured a prominent non-binary guest star. And it's also worth mentioning that Strange New Worlds Uhura actor Celia Rose Gooding uses they them pronouns and identifies as gender non-conforming. And on the topic of relationships, let's talk about Jordy. Jordy this season gets to be a father, and I like his moments with both of his daughters, even one of them being played by his real life daughter. But Jordy in this season seems to be here more in service of Data's story. Data, you made me better. You did. You made me a better man, a better father, a better friend. As well as his daughters. To be thinking about us. I grew up listening to your adventures. All the times you and Picard stood up for what was right. It's a different time. No. It is you and I that are different. The only thing that he really gets to have of his own in terms of contributing to the narrative is as keeper of nostalgia. Thank the good old Prime Directive. The saucer was retrieved from Viridian 3 so as not to influence the system. I've been restoring it bit by bit over the last 20 years. He's here to facilitate the plot and others' narratives, yet we never really get to see much of what jordy has got going on in his life. For example, we never learn who the parent is of Jordy's daughters, who Jordy's potential partner even was. And this isn't necessarily a problem in and of itself, but it does ring as weird, let's say, considering that the main problem that even LeVar Burton, the actor himself, discussed when it came to Geordi's depiction going back to Star Trek's The Next Generation was about how Geordi was often framed as this guy who was ineffectual in relationships. It's insulting. Whether they are aware of it or not, those white men who wrote the show had an unconscious bias that was on display to me and to other people of color. Their blind spot is revealed in the fact that a black man never was successful at one of the basic and most my wife says, there's a lid for every pot. It's true. The idea that Jordy never found a lid for his pot is ludicrous. It's preposterous. And it's insulting. It's part of the problem. In their attempts to be cute, they inadvertently created an aspect of Jordy's character that is very uncomfortable. LeVar Burton, in that quote, relates that the main issue with his character was that he never really got to be in a relationship, and he actually criticizes it as a blind spot of the writer's room on The Next Generation towards black men and how they would handle black men at that time in which the show was written. He's not calling the writer's room of the era actively racist, yet he is saying that it was a blind spot of the perspective of the mostly white writer's room of that series that caused him to constantly be written in this way. Yeah, and yet, when we get a chance to very easily fix this issue of 90s Star Trek in this season of Picard, the show remains silent. And that, to me, is telling. That this season continues to perpetuate these same blind spots. Okay, so, um, being honest, I might have gone, I might have gone a little bit too far with this costume. This outfit is a bit small on me, hence why the boobs are out. I am not just trying to play for the algorithm. At the very least, be happy that I didn't wear my Star Trek Lower Decks fanny pack. And you think that's a joke, but uh, no. No, I own a Star Trek Lower Decks branded fanny pack. They literally, they literally won't fit. Uh, but I wanted to wear my Star Trek Enterprise uniform anyways. So um, I don't think any of you are going to be complaining. And if you do, I'm sorry. They literally will not fit in this uniform. I'm sorry, I swear I'm not trying to tease all of you. Anywho, let's talk about Star Trek Picard. So far in this video, my criticisms have mostly centered around discussing issues of representation or depiction of individual characters and their placements within the story, and how that may stem from a limited perspective on how to fit them into this larger tapestry of this universe. But I also think these issues extend further into how this season discusses its themes, allegory, metaphors, and overall messages, especially surrounding this season's ideas of what we pass on to further generations, in a way that I think dilutes some of these season's stronger ideas. So let's discuss how many of the season's intentions get muddied by execution. And the best place to start to articulate my issues is through Vatic and the Changelings. I was so excited when we first learned about the Changelings as the season's main villain. In fact, you can even see how excited I was in my review of that episode on my secondary channel. Changeling! 
Holy shit, everybody! It's the goddamn Changelings! I knew that they were gonna do some sort of, like, Deep Space Nine references here, but they are legit continuing off at the end of Deep Space Nine with the goddamn Changelings! I am so excited! When that happened, when that reveal came up, I'm like, Oh shit, Terry Metalist, you goddamn madman! And part of the reason was that I was so pumped to see a storyline of Deep Space Nine, my favorite Star Trek show overall, continue. What would it mean that the Changelings are back? The Dominion War of that series was a foundational shift for the entire Star Trek universe. But since Deep Space Nine ended and Voyager was in an entire other area of the Star Trek universe, we never really got to see the long-lasting ramifications of it, the, the traumas and the evolutions. And it was something that so many of us Trekkies wanted to see and we didn't really ever get to until now. And with this season being about the traumas of the last generation passing on to the next, addressing the Dominion War and its ramifications and the traumas stemming out of it would be a perfect choice. And as we got to learn and see more about these changelings this season, I was really curious to see how they had evolved. How had they changed so that the blood test didn't work? We even see them kill each other in one scene, which seems to go against a core part of the changelings ideology as it was presented in Deep Space Nine, that they don't kill each other. No changeling has ever harmed another. Until you. That's why we forced you to return home. To enter the Great Link and be judged. It was so core to the ideology that it caused them to exile Odo in Deep Space Nine when he killed another changeling in self-defense. So what caused the shift? But most importantly to me, what was this new changeling's ideology that led them to want to go after Jack Crusher and also seemingly have a huge hatred for the Federation? More so than simply them being on the losing side of a war. And the answer that this season of the show presented to us was its most interesting. In episode seven, we hear Vadik's sobering backstory. First and foremost, she has a hatred for the Federation due to their attempted genocide of the Founders. A genocide that was only stopped by Odo in Deep Space Nine choosing to give it to the Great Link so that the war would end. A virus. We gave your people a cure. Is that the tale of your history books? Hmm. You created a cure, yes. But Starfleet voted not to give it to us. One of our own had to steal it. If you remember, Bashir in that show only made the cure for Odo himself, and the Federation was actually unwilling to give that cure to the Founders. It was Odo who finally gave it to them, and Vadik is understandably pissed that the Federation was willing to commit a genocide in order to win a war. We were barely out of the gates of war, and your Federation turned to genocide. And it's fucked up that the Federation was willing to allow that to happen, going against the Federation's stated ideology, and Vadik is understandably pointing out the hypocrisy. True, my understanding recognizes the travesty of the Dominion War. Do not compare the atrocities committed by your side to the warfare executed by mine. There never would have been a war had the Changelings not initiated it. Necessity. Solids like you were coming in and you ruin every world you touch. Now, the Dominion wasn't right either. In fact, it's clear that their plan in Deep Space Nine was to also genocide humans if they won. The key to holding the Federation is Earth. If there's going to be an organized resistance against us, its birthplace will be there. You could be right. Then our first step is to eradicate its population. But she does have an understandable grievance pointing at a failure of the Federation to live up to its ideals in a pretty disgusting and horrible way. On top of that, this season also compounds the issues with the Federation as we also learn that an organization, potentially Section 31, though it's not necessarily named, had kidnapped her and several of her changeling siblings and tortured and did horrific tests on them. Inflicting more torment on me. And those I love. Don't tell me I have no regard for love, or innocence, or pain. So not only does Vadik have an ideological grievance, she has a very, very personal one too, and I love this. I think it's an understandable viewpoint that does not justify Vadik's horrific actions, but does make it understandable where her hatred and vindictiveness comes from, and it's actually one that is a core grievance, and it's actually one that is pointedly addressing an issue of the Federation's choices. Yet, my problem with how this season handles it is that the show needs to address the issues that it brings up with the Federation. But 
In actuality, we never really wrestle with the implications of it. We get a few scenes to feel sad for Vatic, yes, but we never really get a moment for the show to really grapple with her concerns and targeted criticisms of the Federation. In fact, immediately after the scene where she gives her backstory, Picard and Beverly go and instantaneously decide that they should execute her because she's too hateful. To remind herself of her hate. You're right. She's an executioner for her cause. We won't get anything more from her. Like, no trial, no nothing. It's like, well, we got everything we need from her, and also, she's probably gonna go and kill more people, even though we have her in custody right now. So, let's just murder her. She's our prisoner. The moment we allowed her to board, we invited death onto this ship. It's kind of a fucked up choice, but being fair, I will even say I understand this choice on a personal level from these two characters at this point in the season. They're both parents trying to protect their kid as well as the Federation, and they're in a dangerous situation that they don't know if they can hold Vatic indefinitely. And even Beverly herself states that she's not thinking entirely rationally. Willing to compromise everything. Everything that we've believed in. Yes. I think I'm losing my compass. It's a dark choice that, as a character decision for Picard and Beverly in this moment, makes sense. I don't agree with them, but I understand how they got to that decision. It's kind of like Janeway and Tuvix again. Sorry, still too soon? Each of you is going to have to live with this. Yeah, yeah, too soon. Yet after this scene, the show never confronts the choice that Beverly and Picard make to kill Vatic, or even really brings it up again. Even Vatic, after she escapes, doesn't even try to confront them and say, you didn't even attempt to reach out to me. You just went to straight to murder. Like, quite literally, Beverly and Picard showcased the exact problem that she was pointing out about the Federation, and there's just no addressing of it at all. In fact, Vatic just goes on to become murdering people, and she's just displayed as kind of pure evil after that point. <laughs> Our sympathy for her as a villain is meant to be gone after this point. She's just meant to be the person that we have to defeat in her final episode. Yet it would have been a much more nuanced choice for Vatic to call out Beverly and Picard and thereby the Federation as a whole, saying, hey, you just tried to murder me without even thinking about what the Federation did. But nope, we don't get any of that. But this lack of addressing this interpersonal issue is a mirroring of a much more prominent issue that I have with the storyline. Because the fact that the Federation did horrific torture on Vatic is never confronted either, nor is the attempted traumas coming out of the attempted genocide by the Federation from Deep Space Nine. We even get the implication that Vatic's torture was done by Section 31, implying that it was a group separate from the Federation as Section 31 was displayed in Deep Space Nine. And I really dislike that implication because what it does is it washes the hands of the Federation from culpability. Many people, myself included by the way, initially didn't like how Star Trek Discovery portrayed Section 31 in its second season as a part of Starfleet. But the more I think about it, the more I actually like that depiction of Section 31 because it doesn't let Star Trek do what Deep Space Nine did and say, well, these really horrific choices that Section 31 made, it's just a few bad admirals and a few bad apples, not the Federation itself. And how long have you worked for Section 31? I don't. Oh, just a temporary alliance, is it? Something like that. I think it's okay to say, and actually a great storytelling choice to say, that the Federation made a choice out of self-interest and one that's fucked up. But if you're going to do that, you need to go all the way. You need to wrestle with the fact that the system that our heroes are ultimately trying to uphold is making fucked up choices, and our characters need to go after and address it. And this is something that I see other Star Trek shows that are contemporary with Picard doing really well. See the aforementioned Star Trek Discovery, or the Star Trek Strange New World storyline, where we begin to see Starfleet had to confront the implicit biases within the Federation towards genetically engineered people. Regulations, I lied to get into Starfleet. According to Federation law, if you shelter me, they could come after you you too. I welcome that discussion. One thing became clear to me on Head of at Nine. Illyrians are severely misunderstood. Even season one of this very series, Picard, for all its many, 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 many faults. I think understood this better, as that season attempted to showcase the Federation failing to live up to its ideals with its treatment of both Romulans and synthetic life. 
We still don't know why the synthetics went rogue and did what they did that day. But I believe the subsequent decision to ban synthetic life forms was a mistake. Now that season fails to fully resolve that idea, having it all just be fixed by Picard giving a big speech. That's the whole point. That's why we're here. To save each other. In a one-off line at the end saying the prejudicial system legislation ban on synthetic life was repealed overnight and thereby apparently all of synthetic bias was gone as well. And now that they've lifted the ban on synthetics, I'm free to travel. So that season never really directly resolves this question with any sort of nuance, but it does at least attempt to implicate the Federation at least, and tries to say that it's a failing of the Federation. I like it when the Federation is used in Star Trek as a society that strives for an ideal, but fails at it at times, as we see it best utilized in Deep Space Nine or even in elements of TNG with episodes like Measure of a Man. Now the decision you reach here today will determine how we will regard this creation of our genius. It will reveal the kind of a people we are, what he is destined to be. It will reach far beyond this courtroom and this one android. It's saying that it's easy to be a state in paradise, but you have to continually earn and live up to that paradise. You have to stay vigilant, not accept that the status quo is good for everyone, lest the system becomes stagnant and end up only serving the most powerful or privileged within it. It's what makes Star Trek relevant to today to say that the status quo is not good for everyone. And not just making it an alien metaphor, but part of the civilization that our heroes take part in allows us as viewers to understand that maybe we, as people within our own United States, need to actually try to address issues within the United States as well. Because sure as hell, the status quo in the United States right now isn't good for everyone. In fact, not good for most people. Yet, in Picard Season 3, the story never confronts the Federation as culpable in its actions towards Vatic. After Vatic is killed in an Air Force One callback two episodes before the finale, we never again bring up her understandable grievances against the Federation. Instead, the final two episodes of the season shift villains entirely to become about the Borg and the Borg Queen so that we have a capital E villain to fight against and defend the Federation against. Like, ideally, the final villain of the season should not have been the Borg, but the very organization that tortured Vatic. It causes the season to shift focus from ever having to address the issues with the Federation. And it never allows us to address the fact that Beverly and Picard never got confronted on their attempted killing of a prisoner of war without any trial. And it comes across as really fucked up that the show doesn't address it. It comes across as status quo defending and not addressing the problem. And as a result, it ends up having Vatic's storyline come across more as the writers of the season saying, hey, isn't the Dominion War of Deep Space Nine cool? But the reason the Dominion War was cool was because of the ethical questions it raised within a Star Trek framework, not because it was a war within the Star Trek world, or, hey look, the changelings. What made Deep Space Nine work so well as a series was that it asked hard questions, explored them, and found that in that exploration that it didn't always have the answers, yet wanted to at least present them to the audience to ponder. And if your conscience is bothering you, you should soothe it with the knowledge that you may have just saved the entire Alpha Quadrant and all it cost was the life of one Romulan senator, one criminal, and the self-respect of one Starfleet officer. Yet here in Picard, it gives a superficial feeling like it asked hard ethical questions, but it doesn't really care to explore them. They just brought them up and then moved on. It doesn't allow us as the audience to sit and think, is that okay? Is that right? No, we end up just defending the Federation and saying, yeah, no, Federation's perfect, don't worry about any other problems. Nor are there any Deep Space Nine characters in this season of Picard, other than Worf technically, who have an on-screen history and connection with the Dominion storyline, and thus would have to address their actions towards the Dominion as well. Like, it would have been interesting to see maybe Bashir have to wrestle with the fact that he never chose to give the cure to the Great Link. It's a failure on Bashir's part as a doctor. So by having this disconnection between the villains of the series and our TNG characters, it allows our TNG characters to remain pure in our minds in a way that we wouldn't be able to if we had had Deep Space Nine characters who had dealt more directly with the Dominion in a more morally ambiguous way. I don't need a big moral speech from Picard, but I would have liked to see fallout or discussion rather than say, well, Lex murder her in a war crime to hide our other war crimes and then never talk about that again. Instead, we protect Picard's ethical purity by ignoring his morally dubious actions. I didn't know. How remarkable it is that an enlightened species can ignore each other's pain. 
I mean, at least Cisco had a whole I can live with it moral crisis when Garrett killed Mr. It's a Cake over here. It's a fake. Wait, he says it's a fake? I've misheard that this whole time. The cake is a lie. Speaking of evil murderous robots, yes, that's the transition that I'm going with, we also have another plotline in a Star Trek show about AI taking over Starfleet ships in a season finale. It's a storyline we've already seen in Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Star Trek Prodigy Season 1, and Star Trek Lower Decks Season 3. Alito, do you understand? I said attack the Cerritos! I don't take orders from you anymore, father. What? Alito, deactivate independence! Sorry everybody, uh, I had to change out of that costume because I literally could not breathe in it. I had to put away the Borg assets as it were. It all just feels repetitive, and not only that, while I get the idea that AI is a modern day issue in our capitalistic society today, where AI is pushing people out of much needed jobs, I think in a Star Trek post-money future, it's kind of backwards thinking. This constant framing of AI as a villain is Star Trek as a franchise constantly framing new technology as a source of fear and anxiety, when Star Trek as a franchise has generally been more about trying to incorporate new technology and actually seeing it on its own terms, and trying to wonder what that would mean if we did incorporate it into our society in the most ideal way. A lot of Data's storylines were all about how do we as a society incorporate something like Data and how we think about him and maybe even give him his own agency and see him as a person. Your Honor, Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Well, there it sits. Waiting. And it's why I've really loved the Zora storyline that we've seen going on in season four of Star Trek Discovery, which itself is about confronting bias and prejudice in the face of new technology and trauma, and one that moves forward with the idea of AI being accepted, not vilified. It's my official determination that Zora is indeed a new life form. It feels marvelous. What does? Being seen. If I hadn't changed my mind, would you really have extracted her? My evaluation was as much about you and the others as it was about Zora. I can see now that partnership is possible on both sides. But if that hadn't been the case, I would have recommended that you be reassigned to another ship. As it should be. And so seeing AI be used this way in Picard, and also Lower Decks and Prodigy as well to a degree, feels kind of regressive of that. But now that we've talked about AI and the Dominion, it's time to talk about this season's big villain, the Borg. So let's talk about what the Borg are meant to represent in this season thematically. With the Borg Queen in mind, we must consider what the Borg stand for with her. As I said before, when you have the Borg Queen put into the context of the Borg, it changes the Borg from a sort of nebulous natural disaster metaphor to one that represents more authoritarianism and fascism. Jack Crusher even says this in episode 9. He calls the Borg Queen cybernetic authoritarianism. I always thought if people could only see each other, hear each other, speak in one voice, act in one mind together, knew a little cybernetic authoritarianism was the answer. By the way, some people read the Borg as like representing communism or whatever, which I think is a complete misreading of the Borg. I mean, the Federation itself is very communistic in terms of how it's presented throughout the series, though we don't really ever dive into detail of how, how the economics and political structure of the Federation work. But in terms of how it seems to be representing, in terms of its vibes, it's much more communistic. The Borg could represent a sort of more authoritarian in communism that we saw with like people like Stalin, but that does sort of go back more into authoritarianism than it does into communism. And I feel like people reading the Borg as communism kind of stems from our Western, especially United States culture of vilifying communism and collective action over individual one. But getting back to the Borg Queen, the fascism metaphor fits really well because fascism's appeal is that it tricks you into giving up your individuality for the whole because it makes you believe that you should fit the role of the more extensive system. You should become a cog in a greater machine for the state or the nation rather than society being the thing that enables you to find your own role for yourself, as we see, for example, the Federation doing. Fascism, and the Borg as well, say, be a drone for the more significant state collective and our desire for endless consumption, growth, war, and death, and assimilation in pursuit of our larger goal, perfection. For example, we're talking Nazis' versions of fascism, their perfection was the Aryan ideal, and they wanted to assimilate the Earth by expanding German territory and trying to replace everyone with their Aryan ideal. 
And the Borg Queen herself kind of has this same goal of trying to replace everyone with the Borg and press them all into cogs from the machine that she views as perfection. Human. We used to be exactly like them. Flawed. Weak. Organic. But we evolved to include the synthetic. Now we use both to attain perfection. Your goal should be the same as ours. And the appeal for individuals who become fascists within a fascist state is that they find comfort in feeling that they are taking part in something larger, a part of something bigger. You probably can't imagine what it is like to be so lost and frightened that you will listen to any voice which promises change. Even if that voice insists on controlling you. That's what we wanted. Someone to show us a way out of confusion. Lore promised clarity and purpose. In the beginning, he seemed like a savior. The promise of becoming a superior race, of becoming fully artificial, was compelling. We gladly did everything he asked of us. But after a while, it became clear that Lore had no idea how to keep his promise. That's when he began talking about the need for us to make sacrifices. Never mind that no person can ever fit that role that they're supposed to fit into because the state just sucks you dry without caring for you as a person. But it can feel comforting and appealing to feel that you have a purpose, even if the purpose is for the state, not yourself. You've been involved in hundreds of assimilations. This is no different. To you, perhaps. Part of me is still human. I will not assist in their destruction. We all originated from lesser species. I myself came from species 125, but that's irrelevant now. We are Borg. I am an individual. You're only repeating their words. You sound like a mindless automaton. Comply, or we will turn you into a drone. And by the way, for more details on that, I'd recommend reading Everybody Wants to Be a Fascist by Felix Guterri. Now, to be clear, this does not mean that the Borg have to be a one-for-one one with fascism in every single appearance that they have, because fascism is more a sort of semiotics discussion, as it's a dynamic that can feed into any sort of institutional thinking. It means that the metaphor for the Borg as a fascist can work in a lot of ways. For example, you can have the Borg representing a cult with the Queen as a cult leader. You could have the Borg be a government or nation with the Queen as a totalitarian. Or you could have the Borg Collective as a corporation with the Queen as the CEO. You could have the Borg Collective as a classroom with the Queen as my second grade teacher, Mrs. Gerke. All authoritarianism. The Queen becomes the authoritarian leader that everyone serves as a drone for, like workers serving a CEO, the citizenry for an authoritarian, or cultists with a cult leader. And another example that you can put the Borg into is when you think about them in a queer context, with the Borg becoming to represent a heteronormative society, one that tells you that you must not be queer, but be straight. Don't be trans, but be your assigned gender, and marry the opposite gender and have your 2.5 kids for the heteronormative society. Now, before all of you say, Jesse, why are you reading queerness into the Borg? I think it's actually really relevant to be discussing the Borg in a queer context because this season of the show brings it up, specifically with the character of Seven of Nine. Seven of Nine throughout this season was repeatedly used as a transgender metaphor, which Terry Metalis himself mentioned was intentional. As I talked about before, Seven of Nine was dead named by Shaw, someone who doesn't see her as a whole person because of his stigma against ex-Borg like Seven and Picard. Well, this is seven of nine. Commander Annika Hansen, sir. Captain Shaw prefers that I use Hansen. And this metaphor actually works really well because we've already seen that Shaw has an understandable trauma stemming from the Borg. He has a trauma of the society that wanted to make him a drone and killed his friends. I'm just some dipshit from Chicago. And now I'm lucky number 10. But he has scapegoated this trauma and anger not onto the Borg, but onto XBs like Seven or Picard, whom he doesn't see as victims of the Borg society, but as representations of it. Do you know where your old man was on that day? He was on that Borg cube, setting the world on fire! Just as, for example, queer people, and often trans people today, ourselves are more visible and direct victims of a cisnormative society, but because we as trans people or queer people draw attention to the way that we are supposed to be pressed into a single role for society, often become the targets of ire because people see us as breaking out of these roles that they themselves have to adhere to. 
But Shaw is actually able to work through this stigma that he has against ex Borg and start to understand that Seven and Picard are victims themselves, and actually accepts Seven by saying her true name in his death, showing that he finally can move beyond his prejudice and actually see Seven for who she is as a whole person. That leads me to First Officer Hanson. More accurately, Seven of Nine. No. I'm a relic of an older time. We also have Seven of Nine referencing the Voyager as her family. I was reborn there. She was my home. Her crew were my family. Showing that Seven, after she escaped the Borg Collective in Star Trek Voyager, began to reclaim the idea of a collective around the Voyager crew. She created a found family, just like many queer people do after our own families or Unimatrixes don't accept us for who we are and who we actually wish to be. As we approached Borg space, I began to reevaluate my future. The prospect of becoming a drone was unappealing. Sometimes you gotta look back in order to move forward. Sounds to me like you're starting to embrace your humanity. So queerness is actually a very relevant and actually worthwhile metaphor to look at this season through when we talk about the Borg. And by the way, this reading of the Borg as queer is not just isolated to this season of Picard as well. You can find readings that match this throughout the entire history of the Borg, especially in the modern era of Star Trek. For example, just last year, Star Trek Prodigy did a similar story with the character of Zero, the non-binary character on the show, where they break free of the Borg Collective and say that the Proto-Star crew, the Starfleet-like characters of that show, were their collective, their found family. Resistance is not futile. Right. We are I will resist. Because I'm already a part of a collective that is stronger than you will ever be! Brent, are you alright? We must hurry. I lured them into a dormant state, but it won't hold for long. Zero's back! <laughs> I thought we lost you. I've already found my collective. You can also look at the XBs from Star Trek Picard season one as also people who escaped the Borg society and ended up finding their own found family with each other. At least as a citizen of the Federation, I can leave at any time. Unlike all the other XBs on this cube. XBs? Former Borg, that's what we call ourselves. A new name can be the first step to a new identity trying to deal with the trauma that they faced from that collective, but also facing their own stigmas despite them finding their own found family from the Romulan society that they exist in. Still, we remain the most hated people in the galaxy, just as helpless and enslaved as before. Only now, our queen is a Romulan. And it is by no means incidental that the head XB, Hugh, is played by Jonathan Del Arco, a gay man, who said he intentionally played the character all the way from his initial appearance in The Next Generation as an ode to a gay friend who died from HIV. I can remember being a vulnerable, effeminate boy of 10 when we first moved to the United States, sensing danger, afraid that if people found out I was gay, I would be cast out, bullied, or worse. Years later, in my 20s, was afraid again because I was in love with a guy battling AIDS and I saw firsthand the kind of discrimination he faced in employment and in the healthcare system. With ultimately the Federation coming to represent the ideal version of this, where queer people and ex-Borg are allowed to flourish and be their full selves, accepted by society as Seven and Picard are. So why does this all matter? Why is this an issue for me, especially if Seven of Nine's storyline was perfectly well suited for this metaphor? Well, when we look at Jack and Picard, this reading of queerness actually really fits very well. Jack actually uses a lot of the same language of queer people when articulating that he has a feeling that the Borg are part of himself, something that was passed on to him by his father. Listen to a lot of the ways that Jack discusses his Borg self. I've always felt different, like, like there's something wrong with me. 
It, honestly, if you put that dialogue inside the mouth of a closeted gay kid trying to articulate to his father that he feels that he's gay, but not necessarily knowing how to say it, it reads almost as a one for one. So much so that I wouldn't be surprised if Terry Metalis and the writers of Star Trek Picard season three didn't draw directly from that same sort of rhetoric and metaphor to fit Jack as a character. A life of disconnection only to realize times emblematic of war. So when Jack learns that he is a Borg and he tries to come out to his father and talk to Picard about it, Picard doesn't accept him because Picard himself is struggling with his own internal traumas and stigmas. We must take precautions. Precautions? I'm afraid this is not just about you anymore. What do you see? When you look at me, what do you, look at me, damn it, what are you? It's almost like a gay son coming out to his father who doesn't accept him. And so Jack runs away against his father, feeling alone and isolated. And then Jack goes and runs to the Borg. And this fits because that's how fascism draws people in, by dealing with someone's isolation and anger when they're lashing out against a society that doesn't accept them and tries to fit them into a role. So many voices, joyful, welcoming me. Nothing's broken in here. There's no suffering, no loneliness, no fear. It's perfect. But Jack, this euphoria isn't real. Perfection isn't evolution. This is death. This is where I'm meant to be. Yet, the problem becomes that because Jack has already discussed him being a full Borg in terms of queer metaphor, it frames the Borg itself as being fully gay. That his desire for a collective and finding a found family that Jack feels comes out of his Borg parts. A life of disconnection only to realize times emblematic of war. A bee seeking a hive for, for a collective, for a queen. Subconsciously, perhaps. This issue is further compounded when we look at Picard, who also has trauma stemming from the Borg. So his rejecting of Jack is not as a father who doesn't accept queerness, it's as a father who has trauma stemming from the same thing that Jack is dealing with. When you look at me, what do you, look at me, damn it, what are you saying? I came close to killing everyone I knew. Everyone I loved. You don't know what it is to be controlled by them. What she can make you do. As a result, this mixes the metaphor in a really problematic way that frames the Borg, the fascist society that Jack runs to that is clearly used as a fascism metaphor within this season as well. I've always known the world was imperfect. Broken systems, wars, suffering, violence, poverty, bigotry. I always thought if people could only see each other, hear each other, speak in one voice, act in one mind together. Who knew a little cybernetic authoritarianism was the answer? as the thing that Jack needs to expunge and cure himself of or deal with. The same thing that Picard himself is dealing with, which conflicts with viewing being an ex-Borg having escaped the society as being able to be your full and complete self. You really okay with this? Maybe better than okay. Hmm. The Borg is a fascistic collective literally creeping into the public, mainly the younger generation's consciousness, if we aren't careful or vigilant in our values, could work as a theme of the season. That if people don't pay enough attention, fascism creeps into our society and infects us. But by placing it one within a story about generational anxiety, as we see the younger generation being assimilated by the Borg against the older generation, and two, giving the character of Jack a lot of queer-related dialogue that comes directly from him being born Borg, such as him saying he never felt right, always felt alone in his experience, now then places the Borg as the queer metaphor, which then plays into this idea of the queer community being fascist, which is a really, really problematic idea that we've seen come up a lot in the past few years in real life. The idea that queer people are transing and gaying the children, that they're co-opting and trying to convert youth, that they're preying upon our kids. With increasing alarm, as vulnerable children have become the objects 
of a political experiment. Vulnerable, distressed, confused children and adolescents instead of being given the psychiatric help that they need. That queer people and trans people are totalitarian bullies trying to press everyone into their gender ideology. Of this barbarism, and it is barbarism. We did a whole documentary on it. And by the end of the documentary, we were more shocked than when we started reporting it out. Even people who support these procedures can't actually defend them. And that's the whole point. They have to make you shut up because they don't have any facts on their side. If you're not okay with child abuse, you're a murderer. And it's worked on a lot of weak-minded journalists who only care about status and acceptance by the group. And need to be eliminated from public life. And if it's false, then we should not indulge it. Especially since that indulgence requires taking away the rights and customs of so many people. If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology. Like quite literally, the season ends with the Borg Queen turning all of the younger generation into Borg, like transing or queering the children. And if you think I'm overreacting to people possibly getting this reading for the Borg, I should say, I saw the night the finale aired, this tweet going around on Twitter, getting a lot of play from people as an accurate analysis of the season and its themes. This reading of the Borg this way rings grossly similar to how TERFs or Republicans frame trans people as a social contagion being caused by transgender influencers in Hollywood and YouTube. Transgender identity. Okay, that, that is something that is typically, and we know that it's introduced by the culture. And that's not something we ever did with kids before. I mean, they might have, you know, had some gender confusion about who they really were, but we didn't validate it immediately. Today, it's getting validated all over the place. To be clear, this is not me saying that this reading was the writers of this season's intention. What I am saying is that their mixed metaphors and inconsistent theming, as well as their use of alien cultures as coded otherness, can easily lead this reading credibility. And this dovetails with this season in really problematic ways that also undermine our characters. For example, the scene where Troy, a professional therapist who literally tells Jack that she will stay with him the entire time as he explores his identity, runs away from that therapy session in terror when she learns Jack's secret and then goes and tells his parents his deepest secret before she even tells Jack, is hugely problematic. Deanna, what's wrong? What happened? Not only for Troy as a character, because it makes her look to be a shitty therapist, but also, especially in the modern day climate of laws going on right now being passed, forcing teachers and others to out transgender kids to their parents, which may put them in danger. And this is a problem throughout the entire season where Jack as a kid is shown not to be able to have agency in his own medical decisions. Like for example, when Beverly shares Jack's medical information with Picard without checking with Jack first. You're certain. The portions of the brain related to cognition, imagination, all affected. According to this, Jack has a rheumatic syndrome. Inherited from me. It shows a lack of concern for a child's own desires. This is a problem we're also continually seeing in the real world with anti-transgender rhetoric. This issue becomes even more problematic with how Jack's Borg powers work because he can control other people's bodies and do so without their consent. He forces himself upon other people through his coded gayness, which is fucked up. This storyline could work if you had the storyline be about informed consent with him and him needing to get informed consent before he takes over someone's body, and you still could with Jack as a character in a future show, but at the end, it's still really messed up. And I heard some people say, well, you could read Jack as actually coming out to his dad and his dad not accepting him, so Jack runs away and joins the military, another large organization that the Borg could serve as a metaphor for. Again, fitting that fascism idea. But if that's the read that you're going with, that means Jack's running away to join the Borg, which is inside of him. So is like being in the military something you're born with and self-hating about? It mixes problematically too with the metaphor of Seven of Nine not being accepted by Shaw because it sort of says, well, he's not accepting her because she was in the fascist military, which would then frame her metaphorical queerness as fascistic again. This issue goes even further with Riker referring to the Borg as the Borg infection. Starfleet has implemented a fleet-wide transporter solution to purge our young officers of the Borg infection. We just spent season two of Picard and even her time spent on Voyager having Seven of Nine accept her Borg part of herself as part of who she is. Do we see her saying her Borg parts are infection? You really okay with this? Maybe better than okay. Hmm. 
That line of wording, again, mixing with the metaphor of her being trans is problematic, especially if we think of the anti-gay and anti-trans rhetoric going around today, that trans people are a social contagion infecting the children that needs to be cured. What many of these researchers, including myself, have come to believe is that many of the trans identifying kids are identifying this way, not because of some lifelong gender dysphoria, but rather it's due to an echo chamber of social media. Now this echo chamber produces a kind of social contagion. And all this feeds into a kind of, kind of older mentality of a generational anxiety, of kids of the younger generation being a source of fear for the older generation. It plays into this very boomer style fear that the kids are coming to get you with their AI computers and their technology especially considering we have AI being what's used to facilitate fascism entry into the Starfleet ships. It frames the younger generation simply as a source of existential dread as replacing and murdering the older generation in a very Oedipal way. And we even have an Oedipal mother figure in the Borg Queen. For example, the way the Borg were written in this season goes back to the way the Borg were written in the early 2000s before they were updated in things like Star Trek Picard season one or Star Trek Prodigy, with the Borg being framed as queer fear. One could read the Borg at the time as a contemporary fear of encroaching otherness in a society that cannot assimilate into the larger American, or in this case, Federation, culture. Thinking about the male homosocial aspect of the Borg and the ways in which the Borg Queen simultaneously disrupts and extends the homoerotic implications of this homosociality only deepens the questions of the intersection of race and sexuality here and everywhere in Trek. The Borg are a cartoonish totalitarian antithesis to Trekkian liberal humanism. The Borg of First Contact are a primeval horde with no father, only a phallic, erotically fulfilled, and libidinally platonous mother. The appearance of the Borg Queen can be seen as a triumphal assertion of the pre oedipal mother filling the space on the screen and, by extension, spectorial desire with the absolute plenitude of her delicious jouissance. If the Borg are an allegory for a queer subculture, they are specifically an allegory of queerness as a race. Anonymous and continuous, the exchange of fluid data among the Borg conjures the fleeting faceless sex in bars, bathrooms, and public parks of the gay sexual demimondi in the 70s and early 80s. Picard is forced into the endless homosexual link of the hive mind, as well as made witness to prosthesis-enhanced, cybernetically heightened queer Borg sex. Is that good for you? That quote that was just read was from a book that analyzed the Borg in Star Trek as queer before Star Trek 2009 came out. And it showcased that this reading of Borg as queer was not something that I came up with, but also frames the Borg as something that represents a sort of fear of otherness coming into a society. Otherwise might be subjected to surgical procedures that remove body parts or uh, being prescribed medications that make permanent changes to a child's body. Oh. It's a shame you're not alive to experience disembodiment. It's the epitome of perfection. Before Star Trek Picard season one and storylines with the XBs like Hugh, Seven of Nine, and Picard, the Borg simply could be read as something that needed to be eliminated due to their threat. Jean-Luc, it's one of your uniforms. Yes. This was Ensign Lynch. Tough luck, huh? If the Borg are a race of invaders who suggest the racial, gender, and sexual other, the welter of allegorical modes they embody may represent their particular, peculiar fearsomeness in the Trekkian world. Like no other race, they cannot be rehabilitated, remaining staunchly, resolutely other. In this regard, Picard and Data both may be said to enact a symbolic purgitation of their fused racial and sexual threat at the climax of First Contact a kind of ethnic, gendered, and sexual cleansing at once. The authoritarian white male and biracial male, data here being both android and human and always the android aspiring to the condition of the human, unite to eradicate the otherness. This is why I kind of wish Gerardi Borg had been done much better than she actually was, because conceptually the idea of integrating the Borg into the Federation is one that actually really resurrects the Borg's otherness as a way to integrate into Federation society, rather than coding the Borg as simply enemies who needed to be eliminated. Sadly though, Borgrati was 
not really done well or discussed well. Yet, understanding that XBs were victims of a larger society reframed the metaphor. Yet, Star Trek Picard Season 3 returns to this idea, with Jack needing to cleanse himself of his otherness to be able to fully integrate into Federation society and join Starfleet. Whereas before, when he had his Borgness as a part of him, he was relegated to living on the outskirts of society with his mother. Yet now, he's able to cure himself of the woke mind virus that has infected the youth of Starfleet and become a model citizen. Alongside his father. And on top of that, all of the entire younger generation of Starfleet should also have trauma from having been Borg now. They should all be ex-Borg and know what it's like that Seven and Picard have faced sort of stigmatization as Borg. So it would create an entire generational gap of trauma. Yet none of that is addressed and we just get a joke about nepotism. For Starfleet to put you on such an accelerated track, trust me, it's an honor. Well, nepotism. I also take issue with his very hero's journey type of great man narrative. In a way, Jack sort of becomes a chosen one style of character. Not only is he the child of two of our famous characters from the next generation, he's also the important deus ex machina needed by the Borg. Yes, the Queen is coercing and manipulating his mind to a degree, but he as a character has now shown that he's willing to run off and go and join a large fascist collective and has to be drawn away from it, even though he sees its appeal. He ultimately becomes a Schrodinger's fascist, able to take down the Federation if he so chooses, or reaffirm the status quo if he so chooses. If it were possible for you to kill me, you would have already. But then this recenters the entire themes of the season around Jack's narrative and decision. Whether or not he should change the status quo into fascist authoritarianism, which now through the mixed metaphor is now coded as queer and through the Borg Queen herself as motherhood and feminine, or bring it back to what it was before. The Starfleet that Jean-Luc Picard ultimately represents through his fatherhood, leading Jack to finally join Starfleet in the end. A Starfleet that has killed off some of its more assertive female characters. As well as, as Carrie Metalis argued, has forced through its regulations its two queer characters to downplay their queerness. Rather than the actual discussion that we saw that should have come up with the changelings, should the status quo change? This is a problem that I see a lot with Heroes Journeys, and I actually have a whole video that I want to be doing on it in the next few months. Be looking forward to it because it's one I'm really excited about. This is why, in my opinion, we consider the Borg a fascism metaphor, especially considering the rise of fascism right now in America. It's essential to make sure you get that metaphor right and target it where it needs to be targeted, because otherwise it plays into stigmatizing tropes. Ones that people will then use to try to stigmatize queer people who are trying to be within the Star Trek fandom or discuss this series. As well as people who are trying to use Star Trek, which has always been about talking about the modern day in which it was made and trying to use it to talk about more modern issues. Also, as an aside, it's worth mentioning that the changelings themselves were also coded as queer and fascist in the 90s Deep Space Nine as well. Living among the solids has damaged you far worse than I realized. It has left you ignorant of the gifts you possess. They are literally a group of people of indeterminate fluid gender who live in a polyamorous pool called the Great Link, which is coded as akin to sex, at least when done between individual changelings. Enough talk. Link with me. Here. Why not? I don't think that's a good idea. Are you embarrassed? And they are persecuted for their otherness by solids, who live in a static form. The solids feared our metamorphic abilities. So we were beaten, hunted, and killed. And then the changelings form a fascist government in order to create an ethnostate that then works to subjugate and kill solids. Why control anyone? Because what you can control can't hurt you. So many years ago, we set ourselves the task of imposing order on a chaotic universe. Is that what you call it, imposing order? I call it murder. What you call it is no concern of ours. And the DS9 episode Chimera also used the language of queerness to discuss being a changeling. Was only doing what comes naturally to us. You never pulled a stunt like that. You're smart enough to know that people don't want to be reminded that you're different. And while this season of Star Trek Picard leans less into the queer metaphor with the changelings than it does with the Borg, it's still somewhat there. And still codes the changelings as other. How remarkable it is that an enlightened species can ignore each other's pain. Do you think she'd have kept your son from you if she could feel your loss? 
In fact, that episode, Chimera, was specifically an episode done very late in Deep Space Nine's run that used metaphorical queerness through the Changelings to directly confront the Star Trek franchise's consistency in coding aliens as others by using specific human groups. Our people reproduce. It's more complicated than that in our natural state. We don't exist as separate entities. I don't understand. Our people spend most of their time in the Link. The Link? It involves a melding into one, a merging of thought and form, idea and sensation. You're speaking in riddles. It's difficult to explain. Then don't. Show me. The most obvious example of this would be the bronzing of white actors' skin and the Fu Manchu beards of the Klingons in the original series, or the use of African stereotypes for an alien culture in the Next Generation episode Code of Honor. But Trek has done this more subtly throughout its entire history, such as the franchise using cultural signifiers of indigenous American groups to code aliens throughout its entire history. Chimera in Deep Space Nine, then, is an episode using the queer coding of the Changelings to talk about how Star Trek often used this culturally coded alien otherness as something external to the more American and Western culture evoking Federation and Starfleet cultures so that these aliens could be either understood, pitied, or feared, rather than acknowledged as something that is fully accepted or integrated into Federation society. They tolerate you, Odo, because you emulate them. What higher flattery is there? I, who can be anything, choose to be like you. But even when you make yourself in their image, they know you are not truly one of them. They know that what you appear to be does not reflect what you really are. It's only a mask. What lies underneath is alien to them. It's an episode that worked to acknowledge Trek's tendency to otherize and confront it through the intentional usage of queer coding of the Changelings as a way to signify otherness being failing to be integrated into Federation culture. I'm sorry you can't understand. You've done many things, been many things, but you've never known love. Compared to the Link, it is a pale shadow, a feeble attempt to compensate for the isolation that monoforms feel because they are trapped within themselves. Perhaps the fact that it's not easy is what makes it worthwhile. Odo, the Founders are dying. This could be your last chance to exist the way you were meant to. Don't throw it away. And this ethos of attempting to reckon with the franchise's uses of otherness and its needing to be integrated into Federation society rather than just simply viewed through the lens of otherness is something that previous seasons of Star Trek Picard tried to do with the XBs, the Synths, and the Borg with Jurati. You long for what we all long for. Connection. Longevity. Discovery. Only you offer it without choice. Though doing so in a much less nuanced way than Deep Space Nine did, and frankly, kind of in badly written ways. But conversely, this season of Star Trek Picard Season 3 just returns to viewing aliens such as the Changeling and Borg through that monstrous culturally coded otherness. And how exhausted they must be. As a my dear, as are we. As are our brothers and sisters who suffer each day having to wear the faces of the Federation. Right down to the visual effects for the Changeling's morphs being more gross and disgusting, or the usage of queer metaphor for the Borg throughout the season. And even more doubles down on them being something needing to be feared and defeated rather than understood as previous Trek shows did. Like all the alien cultures that are seen as external to the Federation throughout the season of Star Trek Picard are viewed through the lens of something to be feared and destroyed. She's our prisoner. The moment we allowed her to board, we invited death onto this ship.
rather than seasons one and two in Picard, which ended on storylines of accepting these differences into the Federation culture, or at least coexisting with them. We request provisional membership in the Federation so that we may remain here. The Guardian at the gates. It's clear to me that this season of Picard had a reverence for the aesthetic of Deep Space Nine, but not of that series' ultimate themes in the face of the larger franchise. Instead, with this season of Picard more upholding the next generation's thematics of otherizing different cultures. All this is why you can't mix your metaphors within a single story. To be clear, the Borg can be used differently across different stories. I mean, the Borg have been seen in many different ways by many different writers, as I said before. Terry Metalis writes the Borg differently from how Star Trek Voyager showrunner Bram Braggett wrote them, who wrote them differently than Maurice Hurley, the creator of the Borg, initially did in The Next Generation. All of that's okay. Nor am I saying that this season of Picard had to be beholden to how the Changelings or the Borg were written in other shows or even other seasons. But when you have them mean different things simultaneously within a single story written by the same showrunner, it creates problems. And those problems are then compounded when you then use those metaphors in ways that otherize the people for whom you're using the metaphors to represent, which can be underscored by the problems with how you are literally representing the non-metaphorical marginalized people within your story. Now, to be very clear, the reason that I am bringing all of this up is not to say, hey, fuck this season for saying, you know, trans people are bad. I don't think that's what the writers are doing. The reason I bring this up is because I find it to be problematic, number one, and number two, to point out how this season kind of doesn't feel very targeted in the types of story it's trying to tell. Yes, it's a fun adventure plot, but when you scratch beneath the surface, the mixed metaphors of Vatic, for example, and the Changelings, or the Borg Queen, end up feeling so mixed and muddy that it just leaves the season feeling thematically unresonant. I bring all of this up, not to hate on the writers, but to point out the issue of a limited perspective. I have no issue with Terry Metalis, but he is also a cisgender straight dude. And that's not a problem. I love you cisgender straight dudes. Have you seen Anson Mount? He's wonderful. Hi. But what that is, is a certain perspective. And a lot of these issues of the season stem from that centering of that perspective alone. In a way, the way Star Trek Picard season three was written goes back to a lot of my issues with the early 2000s era of Star Trek and late 90s as well, where it treated queerness, race, and similar issues with pity, yet also a growing anxiety of otherness. The points of view on black men, queer folks, queer women, and many others are constantly cast as other, in slot into roles that revolve around or fit into the blind spots of a cis male perspective. It's not a bad perspective, but it is one that is limited in terms of the stories that it usually slots people of other backgrounds and depictions within. On top of that, it's a perspective that comes from a position of often benefiting from many of the systems that we currently have in the United States. One where systemic injustices work to make themselves invisible to men like Terry, who need to take an active step in understanding them because they don't often directly face them. And that, to me, seems like something that was lacked in being done this season in writing the shows in terms of how these storylines and characters were written. Let me show you a clip of Terry Metalis in an interview to illuminate what I'm trying to get at here. Terry, can you speak to that a little bit, like in terms of making sure that Picard is diverse? Yeah, I don't know that it's a thing that you make sure of. It should, it should just kind of be part of the DNA. Uh, right on. Uh, 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 of the thing, but... Uh, you know, it, it's nowadays when you go into casting a role, it's just open everything, open diversity, open ethnicity, everything across across the board, and um, and, and you let that dictate it. Um, but again, uh, it's a little different for me because I, I mean, I was raised on the first interracial kiss with the Kirk and Ahura, so uh, even next gen for me is. Um, <clears throat> Some of these things that are certainly pointed when we have dis I have discussions with these gentlemen, I'm like, wow, yeah. you're right. <laughs> that was horrible, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you know, it, it's it's things that that you didn't see at that moment in time because you were just lost in the science fiction of it all and you realize that it was actually really horrible. As you can see in that clip, Terry discusses at the end how there were things that he missed in older Star Trek that, as he motions to the two black men next to him, he didn't recognize until others with a different perspective pointed it out to him. 
by his own admittance, and credit to him for doing so, by the way. He wasn't aware or always understood the implications of certain episodes and themes of prior Star Trek series. For example, take the original series episode, Let This Be Your Last Battlefield. It's an episode of the original series that is often praised for using alien metaphor to discuss race relations in the 1960s. It is obvious to the most simple-minded that Loki is of an inferior breed. The obvious visual evidence, Commissioner, is that he is of the same breed as yourself. Are you blind, Commander Spock? <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. You're black on one side and white on the other. I am black on the right side. I fail to see the significant difference. Loki is white on the right side. All of his people are white on the right side. And it's a really incredibly praiseworthy attempt to address something so pertinent and topical at the time in which it was made. And it's an episode that I personally love to point out to show that Star Trek has always been woke and political going back to its initial incarnation. But it's also an episode that, through its metaphor, imply that both sides of the discussions of race are equally at fault, equally to blame for hating each other. You. you keep this up and you'll never get to share on with your prisoner. The bridge of the ship will be irreparably damaged. This will be your final battlefield. Your 50,000 years of pursuit will have been wasted. <laughs> and you, Lokai, will die here in space. You'll inspire no more disciples. Your cause will be ended. And that the way to resolve race relation tensions is just simply by having both sides just stop hating each other, and that would just stop the cycle of violence. But that is actually not the case. In the United States, there is a clear power imbalance that is systemic, where institutional power constantly disenfranchises black people. And it's one that black people are not responsible for, nor could they simply stop it by choosing to just end their anger at said system. They actually need to actively constantly fight said system because if they don't, then they will be taken advantage of and disenfranchised even more. Black people did not earn rights simply by staying silent or just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm done being angry at you. Ultimately, by framing the story this way, Let This Be Your Last Battlefield ultimately serves the status quo, saying that, well, huh, come on, we, we can all just get along, and it doesn't directly implicate the system nor the people who perpetuate it. It's status quo defending and individualize a problem by not questioning the system. Does that sound very familiar to you? And this episode of the original series had this blind spot, despite its good intentions, because it was written mostly by white men in the room who were progressive, but had a limited perspective and understanding of the issues in which they were discussing. It would have been fixed if more diverse people like black folks were actually included in the writing decision making, not just as tokens on screen like Uhura was, not to downplay Nichelle Nichols' incredible importance to history on and off the screen, but within Star Trek, she was visible and a symbol of diversity within the series, but it wasn't really inclusive of her and her thoughts. And this problem was something that continued throughout all of Star Trek. It's quite literally what my sex and Star Trek videos are about. How, while they show like Star Trek was trying to often be progressive and try to represent different people, it often otherized them and mixed metaphors and got things wrong and placed people into very stereotypical and oftentimes problematic roles. What makes them heretics? We believe the Makers created the Chosen Realm in nine days. They believe it took 10. I am black on the right side. I fail to see the significant difference. Loki is white on the right side. All of his people are white on the right side. Like, remember that time that Star Trek The Next Generation accidentally said that gay conversion therapy was possible? What are you talking about? It was all a mistake. And I should have realized it from the beginning. What? that I was sick. I had these terrible urges, and that is why I reached out to you. But it was wrong, and I see that now. Not intentional by the show, but one that is frankly very problematic and very clearly there. But I see these same issues of a limited perspective being perpetuated within this season of Star Trek Picard, specifically when it comes to women's roles, queer people's roles, and black people's roles, as well as the intersection of all of those things. 
And I want to be very clear because I've seen other people assuming that this limited perspective was active malice. I've been seeing people accuse Terry Metalis of having an alt-right agenda or being transphobic or something like that, which I think is off base. I personally met Terry and I don't know him super personally, but from talking with him, I can tell that he is supportive of trans people and many other queer folks and BIPOC folks, including people in his staff as writers and in the fandom. For example, I will be very open and say that Terry Metalis actually reached out to me after the recent attack on transgender rights after the Nashville shooting and specifically asked, what can I do for trans people? It showcased that he is a man who is able to listen to the community and care about them and actually does wish to hear that. But I also want to be clear that I don't want to let Terry or the rest of the staff of Star Trek Picard this season off the hook. And you can even see it in that earlier clip that Terry discussed where he says you can just do blind casting calls. Nowadays, when you go into casting a role, it's just open everything, open diversity, open ethnicity, everything across across the board, and, um, and and you let that dictate it. And I disagree with that ethos. It's a nice ideal to have, and one day we should reach that. I, I want that to happen. But it kind of comes across as the same thing we saw during Obama era politics of like, we are, we're past racial issues. We live in a post racial society, but in actuality, we live in a society that stigmatizes and systemically disenfranchises a lot of people and our voices from being heard in things like this. There's not a lot of trans writers, for example, within Hollywood. And actually, uh, as I was editing, I realized I actually wanted to make a little bit more of a longer point about this idea of colorblind casting and how it actually creates problems within this season of Star Trek Picard by reinforcing problematic narratives. Uh, and sadly, I don't have my very sexy set anymore because I did this after I filmed everything. So you're just getting this creepy, uh, like, uh, pillow of Patrick Stewart with his with his little bald head, with his little, his little bald head and fish feet. It's kind of fun. Uh, anywho, the reason that you don't do colorblind casting is specifically because it can end up reinforcing problematic stereotypes of marginalized groups, particularly when you use colorblind casting uh, in parts that are sort of ancillary or to the side of the main characters that you are like specifically casting. Uh, because, you know, where you place marginalized folks in specific situations in the background can be really problematic. For example, within this season of Star Trek Picard, there are a few times where some of the changelings that get killed by uh, Seven of Nine and our heroes transform into black people. And it, ha and then we have our heroes, you know, vaporize them. And that reinforces this problem of us continually seeing, you know, black people being the victims of violence uh, within media. You know, there's this continued problem from like even the horror movie tropes of the black person is always the first one killed of, you know, black people being seen as the more disposable people and people who can be violently murdered, especially when, uh, you know, they're placed in like the villain role of the changelings. Uh, when, you know, we get to see black people being treated as the villain and, you know, cannon fodder to just be tossed away with. And even more problematic when you consider that being shot by people in supposed positions of authority is a very real fear for many black people. So if you're trying to have a fun adventure space show, it's probably best not to accidentally use traumatizing imagery. We can even see this more problematically with uh, the non-binary character this season because, you know, in the penultimate episode of the season, when the younger crew members get taken over by the Borg virus, the non-binary character is the one that takes the captain's chair on the Titan, uh, as I'm showing in the B-roll right now. And this ultimately can reinforce this idea that I've been talking about this whole video that, you know, the trans people are the ones controlling and manipulating the youth. So to have the non-binary character be sort of visually, and I know the Borg are sort of more of a collective and don't have an individual leader outside of the Borg Queen, but to have the non-binary character be the one that you center on as the one taking the seat in the captain's chair sort of reinforces this idea subtly that non-binary people, trans people, are the ones who are sort of like manipulating manipulating the youths and controlling the youths when we look at this storyline through that sort of like woke mind virus lens.
And I want to be very clear, none of this was intentional by the people who are working on Star Trek Picard. None of them wished to reinforce these stereotypes and stigmas through their casting. The reason that this happened, it is clear to me, is because whoever the casting director was for this season sat down and said, okay, you know, we have all these roles on the show. We, you know, we have all of our lead roles. They're pretty much cast, you know, they're from previous seasons, things like that. And hey, uh, Terry Metalis is bringing in Todd Stashwick and some of his friends from 12 Monkeys to be the other lead, you know, talking roles. So why don't we fill out the rest of the bridge crew and some of these like sort of ancillary roles of like the, uh, the uh, villains of the series. Let's just make the show really diverse and, you know, cast some non-binary people, some black people. And it was it was a earnest attempt by whoever the casting director was to make the show appear more diverse, you know, to get more diverse people on screen, to get them roles in a big budget TV show, you know, ultimately trying to, to do good for marginalized folks. And uh, that, you know, that's a credit to them. But by doing so in a way that just sort of says, yeah, we'll cast whoever, wherever, wherever we have lo slots to fill, can end up reinforcing these narratives. And it's not in ill intent by the people who are making the show, but it is something that just shows that they are not paying attention and are ignorant. And I want to be clear, this is something that everyone falls into. You know, I I I'll be honest uh, myself that I have done this. You know, some of you may know that right now I am working on my own short film. And I don't want to spoil the plot of it because I want it to be kind of fun. But what I will say is that in the short, I do have a character who is, you know, a big CEO within the story and is actually the villain of the story. I have a big CEO villain within the narrative of my short film. And as I was writing the script, the uh, main villain the CEO character says his name. And, you know, I was just looking online. I was like, ah, what can I name this character? I'll just name him whoever. And I said that his name was Steve Cohen. And what I didn't realize, I just sort of randomly picked a name, was that Cohen is actually a Jewish last name. And it wasn't until I had a friend of mine read over the script as a sensitivity reader to sort of give notes and see where I may have missed things, where my friend told me, it's like, hey, did you know that that's a Jewish last name? You might want to change that because it's probably a bad idea to have your CEO villain character be Jewish or even be coded as Jewish because then that would lean into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories around Jewish people controlling the media, controlling, you know, money and things like that. And I'm like, oh, I should change that. I didn't realize that. It wasn't intentional on my part to propagate anti-Semitic stereotypes, but it was something that I unintentionally wrote into my script on accident. And it was on me to make sure that I went out and found sensitivity readers, talked to people of different backgrounds to sort of uh, say and call me out during the creative process that, hey, this is actually fucked up. Maybe don't reinforce that. I know you didn't mean it, but this is what it would ultimately say if you released it in this state. And I went, oh, you know what? I should fix that. So that is sort of what I'm talking about when we talk about these issues within Star Trek Picard Season 3. It's not me sitting here saying, you know, the writers of the show or Terry Metalis were malicious people trying to, you know, hurt others or trying to reinforce really negative stereotypes or trying to be super problematic. What it is me saying is that they were unfortunately not aware of these things and to me and maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm presuming but to me it looks like they didn't do the legwork to go out and you know look and talk to people about what uh, stereotypes they might have ended up being reinforcing and ultimately it comes across in the show and i will also give them the grace to understand that they are these are creative people working for a giant mega corporation that's like you need to make this thing now do it now get it done as fast as possible we have a lot of money on the line so i get you know things fall through the cracks and mistakes are made you know it, it's understandable but it's also not something that I can hand wave away and say that it's not there. So while I can give them the grace to say, I know this wasn't malicious, I know you were under a lot of pressure, I also have to sit here as a critic and someone watching the show and say, but unfortunately, these things are there and they aren't a problem and they end up reinforcing bad stigmas that ultimately lend credence to darker readings of the show for people who want that. Because there are people out there who I'll talk about in a minute uh, in later on in this video who are looking for ways to read these really toxic and disgusting elements into the show. Not something that's intentional by the writers, but it is something that reinforces and gives them sort of leeway to discuss when they are talking about a show like this. The toxic people, I should say. Anyways, back to the video. You've now seen Creepy Picard Doll. <laughs> 
and had my thoughts. But it was just something that, you know, I wanted to add to the video because I thought it was um, a necessary little piece of it. And so as a result, it's on showrunners within Hollywood who uh, understand that their perspective is one that has been centered for a very long time to make an active effort to seek out new life and new perspectives boldly. It's me saying that these people need to become more hyper aware of the issues that they are perpetualizing. And this is an issue society-wide that I think everyone needs to do. And frankly, uh, we can get into my more leftist leaning politics uh, some other time. Uh, but this is more of an issue within Star Trek specifically because it's something I've seen in the reaction to this season of Star Trek with the idea of it being a return to real Star Trek that I've seen a lot of people propagating a line. Whatever writing team is involved in this know what they're doing. <laughs> and that is so refreshing <laughs> in, in Star Trek. I, 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 hope that, I hope they get to go on. Hi. Like, I'm, I'm, I might do something with Star Trek uh, Picard season three, specifically season three, that I, I haven't done for any of New Trek. I might rewatch this on my own so I can enjoy it. Cause now that it's all out and I, I don't have to worry, I don't I, I can like watch it without being stressful yeah. that they're gonna do something stupid. Yeah, you can just enjoy it. I think on a second watch, I might actually just even enjoy this more. I'd love to. That people want more of Star Trek Picard season three than the rest of Star Trek that's been going on. Which seems to forget that there's been a lot of good Star Trek going on for a while now, like Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Prodigy, Lower Decks, and yeah, Star Trek Discovery. There's been a vocal contingent of people arguing that this season of Star Trek Picard was a return to Trek. Now, to a degree, I think that this is in part because Picard has been the biggest Trek show in the zeitgeist for the past few years, and you're having your big TNG reunion and previous seasons of Star Trek Picard, as well as, you know, other elements of the other biggest Star Trek show, Star Trek Discovery, have certainly had their issues. I have been one of the major critics of that. So people coming into this season of Picard who may not have watched Strange New World, Lower Decks Prodigy are saying like, oh, this is much better than, you know, the ones that I had issues with. So, you know, it's a much better show. But I also think beyond that, that there are people who are seeing this season and because they aren't actively thinking about other viewpoints are ignorant of the fact that this season was centering that perspective of the older era of Star Trek, specifically the era of the next generation Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise, which is an era that I love, but certainly centered those perspectives of cis men for a very long time that didn't include others and often otherized marginalized folks quite often and continuing stigmas, even if unintentionally. For example, take Seven of Nine on Voyager, who always had to wear the sexy suit for the male viewpoint or queerness only getting to be alien metaphor. And so it makes me uncomfortable when there's this call for a return to Trek, when this season is perpetuating those same issues, when other Star Trek that has been going on at the same time contemporary with it, like Discovery or Prodigy or Strange New Worlds have been very, very good about being more inclusive in how they represent other perspectives. I think Star Trek Discovery most specifically has done a great job about becoming more inclusive in how it represents different people. Like for example, not saying, hey, here's the queer characters. We'll just have our little one-off so we can say like, look, we have a queer character in our story but actually wrestling with what it means to represent queer people within a story. Showing queer people finding a found family, discussing being trans, having transitioned, or having husbands and wives while also still getting to be competent, career-minded professionals. I just asked because transitioning, it's like I had bigger things to think about, but if I get another chance to remake my body, then why not get rid of all the things that aren't totally me, you know? The characters on Discovery aren't defined by being queer, but they are queer at all times, instead of just the one moments where they kiss their husband that we can cut out for international audiences. It's naturalized and normalized writing queer people. And the same thing extends to black people in that show as well. So for Picard as a show to otherize queer people and many other groups at this time, it bothers me especially given the state of trans issues, black issues, and many others in this country in the United States right now. And before I go on to this next section, I want to make a clear distinction between the people that I've been talking about so far, people like Red Letter Media because I've been using them in the B-roll, folks who I don't really find really problematic, but certainly have blind spots in terms of how they critique and analyze media simply through their perspective, and the people that I'm going to be talking about in just a minute who are, in my opinion, very aware of the problems inherent in the perspective of this media 
And that is actually part of the appeal that they have when analyzing these works of art. So I just want to make that distinction clear that there's a difference between ignorance and blind spots and people who are going to actually try to use these ignorance and blind spots to propagate even more toxic and disgusting ideas and narratives. But all this gets even more problematic from certain more toxic elements of the Star Trek fandom. Those who have never shown up for modern Star Trek before, but feel emboldened to say stuff like this now because of Star Trek Picard season three. Faces and seven of nine, who was not treated well in season one and two. Oh, uh, her and Raffi broken up. No more lesbian relationship. And if any, uh, but seven of nine acts like seven of nine. They have to deal with, I guess, when I say the wreckage of uh, the absolute wreckage of Kurtzman Trek past, they have to deal with crap from before. They do it as fast as they can. So, yeah, it's going to take, it's like you're going to go, oh, I just got reminded of proof. You know, you'll get mad. And it's what it needed, I think. It's what it needed. But what it isn't is intersectional feminism, modern woke Hollywood. It's Star Trek. And it has Star Trek themes, but for the most part, it's uh, it's a pretty traditional story. Ooh, did I say that? This is really frustrating to me because these folks, and I'll specifically call out some of them, Nerd Roddick, Doomcock, and the Fandom Menace, and all those types, have been critiquing Star Trek of the past few years endlessly. And yet the same issues that they have constantly brought up as their criticisms of shows are still present in this season of Star Trek Picard. These folks complained about Star Trek Discovery having pacing issues or mystery box storytelling. That's still here in this season of Picard. They had problems with the fact that we don't get to know the bridge crew of the Discovery, which is the same problem here in Picard on the Titan. We get to have one-off characters like Sydney, but we also had Tilly in Discovery. These people also had problems with the weird plot sophistications that explain the plot holes instead of it making feel natural. We have that here still in Star Trek Picard, such as the yada yadding of why the Borg only assimilated under 25 year olds. Material doesn't propagate in a species past a certain point in the developmental cycle. Which for human beings is age 25, which is when the frontal cortex stops development. They also complain about how Star Trek Discovery didn't respect Star Trek canon having a holodeck or something like that. When Star Trek Picard still has those same exact canon issues, such as for example, the changelings being willing to murder each other when we have clearly shown in past Star Treks in Deep Space Nine that the Changelings weren't willing to kill each other. In fact, it was a whole big deal. We also had them complaining about Star Trek of this era being too murderous and having people like Michael Burnham vaporize bad guys and seeming too cruel for what Star Trek's supposed to be. And yet, guess what this season of Star Trek Picard has? They also constantly complain about Michael Burnham, the black lead character of Star Trek Discovery, being a Mary Sue because she was too competent, despite her being a trained Starfleet officer, or that she was nostalgic fan service with her being Spock's adoptive sister. Yet they also love Jack Crusher this season, who is literally the son of Captain Picard and Dr. Crusher and is also part Borg and is a dude who gets all the girls, has daddy issues and superpowers. Who gets to hang out with Q? You see yours. just begun. Yet he's not a Mary Sue. No, no, no way. Now, to be clear, I myself personally don't view all of these issues as problems, but all these things are understandable issues that you could have with something like Star Trek Discovery, but it's things that these people specifically constantly brought up to say that Star Trek Discovery was bad, actually. Yet, when these exact same issues are within this season of Star Trek Picard, they stay silent. And the reason to me can't be more apparent. It's the fact that this season is not confronting them with having to address the implicit biases of not centering a cis male perspective all the time. And so they look for reasons that they can nitpick all the hell instead of actually addressing the issue at hand. That their perspective is not being catered to or centralized solely anymore. And by the way, there's still a lot of white dudes in Star Trek. Again, look at Captain Pike. Star Trek Discovery is a show that centers a black woman and numerous other folks, when Picard this season isn't. And so these folks don't have to identify with characters that don't look like them because the story is being told through a cis male perspective, hearkening back to this Star Trek that they wish to return to. And some of them may argue, well, hey, we said that it's okay if you dislike this season of Star Trek Picard. And if you didn't like season three of Picard, that's absolutely fine. It's a big franchise that's gone on for more than five decades. There's a wide variety of tastes out there and a lot of room for debate and disagreement amongst the fan base. There's no right or wrong when it comes to people's viewpoints. Just 
differences of opinions, and that's the way it should be. And hey, the statement that he made right there is exactly the attitude that we should all have about big franchises. It's okay to not love every aspect of a franchise, you're still just as much a fan if you hate everything except for one single episode that you love, it's all okay. But these are the same people who have been yelling for years now about woke Trek and SJWs and feminism ruining the franchise, and that anyone who likes it is dumb. Resurrect iconic classic franchises that they have very little understanding of, and then vandalize them with their left-wing identity politics and social justice ideology. Remember in the first episode of the second season of Discovery, they introduced this white male character, Connolly. Connolly is presented as this jerk, an arrogant dude bro mansplainer who mansplains to the always perfect Michael Burnham, and during a dangerous mission through some asteroids, he gets killed right while he's mansplaining to her. He should have listened to the whammon. Michael Burnham knew best. She always knows best. I guess his masculinity must have been toxic. This is some seriously high quality science fiction here. I'm so glad that Hollywood has given up on writing compelling and thought-provoking stories with interesting, deep, and likable characters, and instead focused on the more important issue of being well-received by woke critics as opposed to the audience. Star Trek sure looks to be in great hands. And it seems to me that the only reason that they are saying, oh, it's okay to dislike this season of Picard, the one that they like, is because some people who have also been railing against SJW woke Trek are so pot invested in hating modern Star Trek, folks like Doomcock, for example, that they staunchly said it still sucks. If you fall for this Kurtzman Trek Trojan horse, they will sneak past your defenses into your brain and further eradicate everything you remember about the next generation and even worse, you will be sending a signal to Hollywood that fans are every bit as pathetic as Kurtzman always thought they were. And so these folks that do like this season of Star Trek Picard because it caters to their viewpoint are saying it's okay to hate modern Star Trek, not because they care about someone like me, a trans gal Trekkie's opinion, it's very clear to me that they could give two craps about my opinion, despite the fact that I am more than confident any day that I could school them in my Star Trek knowledge, not that that's a qualifier of fandom, but just catering to their fellow anti-SJW folks who they actually respect because, hey, they look like them. And while this is not a fault of the writers of Star Trek Picard being very clear on that, it is one that is ultimately reinforced by this season of the show because it failed in representing these other perspectives more clearly. Yet. Queer people, people of color, disabled folks, women, are always told to identify with the cis male perspective. We've been doing it for decades. It's why we love shows like The Next Generation, because even beyond its many faults. Those old Star Trek shows have many issues of themselves, but we forgive those issues because we love the story and the characters. But when we ask other people to do the same for us and our stories and allow us to be included in things like Star Trek, which is about being inclusive, we aren't given the same grace. And it's telling. And if I'm gonna be honest with all of you, I worried about making this video. Obviously it's already over long and filled with a ton of critiques, but it's one that I felt very, very passionate about because I think all of the stuff that I said needed to be said about this season. But I worried that by putting it out, I'm going to be seen as the one ruining the fun because so much of the discourse around the season has been really excited and happy and I want to take part in it. In fact, I have in many cases. I've really enjoyed and had a lot of fun taking part in the excitement that people have had for this season of Picard but I do think it's worth discussing these issues. But I worry that by doing so, I'll be seen as the one ruining the fun. Or worse, the bully trying to hate on everyone. Because sadly, there is this constant trend in all aspects of our culture right now, due to the active stigmatization and vilification of trans people and trans women specifically, but queer people and many marginalized groups generally, that whenever someone talks about our perspectives and just asks to be considered, we're seen as the bullies or villains. This is certainly not the first time in a fandom franchise that a lot of people got excited about a new entry in where people like me, trans people, got seen as the bullies just for discussing our issues with it. And it means that a lot of people like me will face harassment when we discuss these issues because people don't want us to ruin their fun or take a video game, sorry, or ruin their favorite season of Star Trek Picard for them. I mean, take this tweet that went out on Twitter. Another queer Trekkie also tweeted about his concerns with this season of Star Trek Picard and Guess what his replies were like? I have found the weirdos in the Trek community and their criticisms are as deranged as I was expecting. I'm shocked that a member of the bratty queer club is here to gripe while helping a pedophile movement take hold. Shocked. What is appalling is all you queers always complaining about shit that doesn't revolve around you. 
Y'all queers need to not ruin the Borg. Alphabet people are insufferable. It's a space show that is as fiction as their belief that men can be women. Just enjoy the pretty ships and flashing lights for fuck's sake. With all due respect and at long last, shut the fuck up. I also saw a tweet that I could not find again for this video where someone was just simply talking about the lighting of black men on Star Trek Picard this season and how they were underlit, which is a constant problem in Hollywood about how black people have historically not been lit properly. It's a long documented issue. And yet that person's replies by some people who consider themselves Star Trek fans was a lot of calling her names. Simply for pointing out a problem that has long been known to be an issue not just of Star Trek, but Hollywood generally towards black people. Constantly we see anyone going against the grain get dogpiled on. Or at least their response is not in line with it, what a Star Trek community should be about. Kindness, caring, hearing others' thoughts, and being open to criticism because we all want this thing to be greater. It's either because we're seen as ruining the fun or because we're making people uncomfortable by discussing the issues that we see. Or people wish to continually uphold the status quo because they know it keeps at or near the top and worry about the trans as queers and people of color and other marginalized groups coming to replace them. When in actuality, we aren't trying to replace anybody, we're trying to make it equal for everybody. Instead, people wish to uphold the status quo and we shouldn't be doing that when the status quo isn't good for everybody. I know many of you out there are gonna take this criticism well or actually agree with me and are really lovely and amazing and I want to let you all know I love you and appreciate you and adore you. But I also know that my comments are probably going to be filled with people saying, You're not a real Trek fan. You're overanalyzing. Of course you hate it. I can tell just by looking at you. Of course this woman would hate this season of Star Trek. Oh, I bet your friends with Kurtzman. Enjoy STD, Michelle. And I'm sure there'll be also a healthy further dose of transphobia sprinkled in that I've been getting on all of my videos as of late, regardless of whether or not I've been talking about trans issues or not. Cause it's great being trans right now in the United States. It's because our perspectives inherently force people to consider how the system is failing not just trans people, but all of us, everyone, even men. And sometimes easier to defend and assume the status quo because it's not hurting you as severely. And I want to be clear, I know many of the people who work on Star Trek. In fact, I'm working on a short film with Dr. Aaron McDonald, who currently works on Star Trek right now. And I know that so many people behind the scenes of Star Trek want to continue to push it forward. Take, for example, the Star Trek podcast with Tawny Newsom, who was a Star Trek Lower Decks actor and Starfleet Academy writer, who constantly talks about wanting to be critical of Star Trek. So by no means saying that people behind the scenes of Star Trek have not tried to be more inclusive. Even Terry Metalis, who, again, included many non-binary people, queer people, and people of color in Star Trek because Picard. Again, it is much more progressive than the older era of Star Trek. But for me, this season of Star Trek Picard has gone back. All of modern Star Trek has grown to let all sides of humanity participate in the story that Star Trek has always been trying to inspire us to tell in real life. It allows us to feel included in the beautiful project of humanity, to show us that infinite diversity and infinite combinations, taking joy in differences and enabling each other to find ourselves for ourselves, that's the project of humanity that we should be working for and that Star Trek inspires us to work for. And it requires everyone to show up for it and requires Star Trek itself to confront its own biases and past and history. Something that this season of Star Trek Picard failed to do. As I watched the finale of Star Trek Picard season three and I saw the next generation crew once again back on the beautiful, beautiful USS Enterprise D bridge fighting the Borg, I felt my conflicted feelings on this season finally resolve and crystallize for me. It felt so amazing to see them back in action and I, I adored it so much. And yet I also realized how much I needed this to be the last time. This season of Star Trek Picard felt like the next generation movie that we never got to have. The story that many of us needed to finally give an end to these characters who we came to know and love almost as much as our own family. Yet it feels like a movie that should have been made in 2005. Because if it had been made then, it would have felt progressive and a step forward for Star Trek and the way it needed to move forward because there's a lot that Star Trek needed to move beyond back then. But today, and after everything that Star Trek has become, this season of Star Trek Picard feels regressive. Sometimes you gotta look back in order to move forward. I have been a proud supporter of modern Star Trek, from Discovery all the way through to where we all are now. But while I have loved it, 
I don't mean to say that it's ever been perfect. In fact, I've tried to be one of its most vocal critics. Because unlike some who wish to criticize to tear it down and rebuild the Star Trek of the past, I want Star Trek to be built up and create a better future. I want to be willing to support and critique it because I believe in Star Trek. It is something that is so important to me and I want to see it grow. And I've seen the stumbles that modern Star Trek has made. Look at Star Trek Discovery Season 1 with its Barrier Gaze storyline, for example. That was an entirely problematic storyline, and yet, since then, Discovery has worked to not only resurrect Culper, but become one of the most diverse and inclusive Star Trek shows ever, including in its queer representation. A complete turnaround from that first season. It showcases a desire on Star Trek's part, in this era, to try to do better. Instead of what happened at the end of Star Trek in the 2000s, where it slowly started to get worse and worse, treating women more and more as objects and still downplaying queerness at an era where every other TV show on at the time was trying to do even better about that. And I want this constructive ethos, one where Star Trek is willing to look at itself and try to do better to constantly continue. And I've seen it do that in shows like Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, and Prodigy. Modern Star Trek has fumbled and it's certainly far from perfect. It's never perfect, nor will it ever be but it has strived to be more than it was. And that effort has yielded it its own reward. It's pushed forward, it's boldly gone. And this season of Star Trek Picard has felt like a step back in that boldly going. And to a degree, that was part of the intention, right? This season was about stepping back and ending out the next generation. But it is a step back. In many ways, this was a return to Trek, but it's a return to a Trek of the past, all of its problems included not a Trek that we need for the future. And this rhetoric being espoused by some showcases to me that some have forgotten, and for certain others, it's part of the appeal, that the older era of Star Trek that they want to return to wasn't great for many people who didn't get to have a voice in making it, or to be part of it. It all feels very make Star Trek great again, forgetting that Star Trek has been great for a very long time over these past few years. And some of these Trek bros just see, either consciously or unconsciously, that this season of Picard still caters to a viewpoint that views women, queer folks, biopic folks, and more as secondary to their story. And that's not a Trek that we need to return to. We should create a Trek that views everyone as a part of the beautiful future, but no one at the center of it all the time. It's not about replacing one person with another, it's about making us all equal. And I'll be honest, I do feel like this is a very relevant concern. I see things like the Michaud-led series Star Trek Section 31 that was originally announced with two women showrunners, Bo Yoon Kim and Erica Lipolti, and Bo Kim being herself an Asian woman, has now been re-announced as a movie written by Craig Sweeney. Not to hate on Craig Sweeney, who I'm sure will do great, but I want Trek to be led by more diverse people behind the camera. And this is compounded by the fact that Star Trek Discovery itself, the only show not run by a cisgender white dude, was recently canceled. And I say all of that with kindness, because I love all of the showrunners. Except you, Mike McBann. I know you're watching. You know. You know. I'm kidding. I love Mike McMahon. He's great. So no shade at any of the showrunners, Terry Metalis included. But... I do want Star Trek to start including more voices in lead roles and to see the two projects that were being led by diverse folks being either downgraded, taken away from them, or canceled has me concerned. There's currently a push going on on social media for a spin-off of this season of Picard called Star Trek Legacy, a show that Terry Metalis himself wishes to make. For most of this era of Star Trek, I've just not cared about what they're gonna do next because I know it's gonna be garbage, but if they do Star Trek Legacy, I'll watch it. And frankly, I would adore a spinoff show featuring Seven of Nine and this crew of the Titan. I would absolutely love that Seven of Nine is one of my favorite characters, but only if that show is on its own terms and one that recognizes the flaws of this season and a show that realizes that it has two queer women and a black queer woman as its two leads. It feels like it would be a show focused on finishing the stories of the past, not telling stories of the future. It's not to say I wouldn't like maybe characters like Esri Dax or Cisco or even some of the Next Generation crew to pop back up in a future series or show, but they don't need to be centralized anymore. They had their shows. And I think it's time we allow them to take a rest and come to an end. And this desire to constantly return to the past instead of creating a new future for the franchise is evoked for me symbolically by the Titan being renamed to the Enterprise G at the end of the series, with the return to the idea of Star Trek constantly needing to be centered on a ship called Enterprise, rather than being able to become something new. 
I mean, if Star Trek Legacy does get greenlit, we'd have two series about a ship named Enterprise featuring characters from the franchise's past running concurrently, with the only difference being one focused on characters from the 60s and the other being characters from the 90s. While the one live-action show featuring a new ship and mostly wholly original characters, Discovery, got cancelled. Like, this tendency for Star Trek to constantly centralize the Enterprise was already parodied two years ago in Star Trek Lower Decks in a way that ended up being more ironically prophetic than comedic. It's the oh no! It's another Enterprise! This is why I love Star Trek Lower Decks so much, because I think it's the closest modern Star Trek gets to that necessary self-analysis that Deep Space Nine brought to the franchise in the 90s, that other modern Star Treks can't get to today because of their constant need to nostalgically hold reference for Trek's past as something sacrosanct and sacred. First love is always the sweetest. Isn't it? Well, she wasn't the first, but she was certainly my favorite. This evokes to me a lot of the same issues that began to plague the Star Trek franchise in the late 2000s that led to its inevitable stagnation and near death. I say all of this not to say fuck Terry Metalis or fuck Star Trek or fuck Star Trek Picard season three. I loved so much of this. I say this because I believe in Terry and Star Trek and everyone else who works on this franchise. I offer my criticisms in hopes of making this thing that we all love better. And I do so in kindness. My rule always has been I never say anything in a video that I wouldn't say to a showrunner's face in person. Or wouldn't say out of an attempt to just have a conversation about things we both clearly love. Creativity in a better tomorrow doesn't come from one person thinking they know best, myself included. Hell, I'm sure I've said shit in here that many of you disagree with. But it is my perspective, and I'm willing to hear yours as I thank you for hearing mine, as we grow together through the conversation. Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. I liked so much about this season. I liked it a ton. I wanted, and in some cases needed, this ending to Star Trek The Next Generation and its characters. Seeing them in the show's final moments playing poker together made me smile from ear to ear. These characters get their happy ending in a way that I never thought I would get to see. But it needs to be an ending. Because, as they say, all good things. We need to move forward. In Star Trek, such as Strange New Worlds, Prodigy, Lower Decks, Discovery, and even hopefully the upcoming Starfleet Academy all look to be doing just that to different degrees. And I hope if we do get a Star Trek Legacy series, which I earnestly hope we do, I hope it does continue that as well. I hope that Terry, if he gets to run it, will take my criticisms into account, or at least hear them out. But at the end of the day, for me, this season of Star Trek Picard Season 3 was where this tremendous final journey needed to end. I'd rather believe that time is a companion who goes with us on the journey, reminds us to cherish every moment, because I'll never come again. What we leave behind is not as important as how we live. After all, no more, we're only mortal. Speak for yourself, sir. So we all just ran a Star Trek marathon, didn't we? Thank you all so much for watching this overlong analysis of Star Trek Picard season three. I know this video will do terribly in the algorithm, but as I wrote my review, I started to understand that there was a lot of concerns and criticisms that I had that I really wanted to put out there because Star Trek is something that means a lot to me. It's what's inspired me. It's what I care about a ton. So I, I just wanted to put my thoughts out there and I hope it comes across in the uh, spirit in which it was intended. 
intended in that I wanted this to be a criticism and conversation with not only other fans and people who liked this season or were critical of it, but also the people who worked on this season of Star Trek uh, because clearly those people are amazing as well and I'm by no means shitting on them or hating on them because we all love this thing so clearly very much. In fact, I know the people who work on this season of Star Trek Picard really loved it because I actually got to speak to a few of them. I actually spoke recently to the art director of this season of Star Trek Picard, Liz, who is a friend of mine going back to my college days, who was the person who got to help recreate that beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous Enterprise D bridge. And I got to interview her and talk to her about all the nerdy nitty gritty of doing all of that and it was so much fun. So if you want to actually check out that interview, here comes the plug part, apologies. Uh, you can now, f you can go and find that interview on my Patreon and on Nebula. Patreon is the place that you can directly support me and honestly every patron uh, there is helping me pay my bills and be able to do all of this stuff and make these overlong videos like this as well as my larger uh, projects that I'm currently working on on this channel such as the video that I have coming out in a couple of weeks where I'm going to be talking about a very personal discussion on masculinity, being trans right now in the United States and much more and it'll be uh, a video that I'm really very proud of and I'm trying to do some cool stuff with as well as other projects that I have coming out on this channel. But the other place that I mentioned is Nebula, which is the streaming service that I made with some of my fellow YouTube creators where we can make videos that we know won't do well in the algorithm and can be put there without having to worry about all of that stuff. And I will say supporting me on Nebula is also great because it does also help me pay my bills, but even more so I am currently working on a film alongside my producer Dr. Aaron McDonald, who many of you may know is the science producer on Star Trek as a franchise. He's amazing and wonderful and we're making a very, very exciting science fiction cyberpunk film uh, that is going to be released exclusively on Nebula. So if you support me there, you get access to that film and also support that project as well. And if you sign up to both Patreon or Nebula, you get access to some exclusive content like the aforementioned interview, as well as your name and videos and things like that. But don't worry, that interview will be coming out in a week or so for everyone else on my secondary channel, Jesse Gender After Dark. But that's all the promotional stuff. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and have fun on this channel. There's a bunch of other things. If you like this video, I would highly recommend going check out my Sex and Star Trek The Next Generation video because it goes into a much longer discussion about many of the same issues that I was discussing in this video. Uh, but beyond that, I hope you all, my friends, just, always, as always, live long and prosper. Mwah. Now I gotta go put away all my Star Trek cosplay. Nah. <laughs> I'm just gonna wear it to bed. I'm a weirdo. Hey. Hey, you. Yeah. Yeah, you. You cutie patootie nerds. <laughs> cutie patootie, I'm a goddamn 1920s grandma. Anyways, thank you all you wonderful nerds who are my patrons, who allow me to do this, who allow me to do what I do. I could not do this uh, YouTube channel. I could not pay my bills. I could not support my baby Newt, my kitty Newt without all of you. So thank you so much for all of that. And an extra special thank you to Catherine Lambeth, Carrie Ellen Foss, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Lily Gray, Ogisha Wise, Mary Mello, Heather Long, El Tan Tivy, Bobby Ann Rounds, Jack McAllen, Stephen Kleinard, Quattro, Michael Wolnes, Courtney Ray Kelly, Jem Shin, Ali Gobert, Alex Miller, Barbara Ruski, Randy Thompson, Matt Chung, Christian Hurst, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Alan Altman, Super Desi, Wellington Marcus, Christine S, Britz Creek, Zach Cody, Screaming Vixen, Lily Bailey, Jessica Kimbrell, Boyd Earl, Vincent Ellington, Meadow Whisper, Felicia Tost, Chloe Dollar, Joseph Dewey, Marshall Nye, James Krivda, Gordon Alexander, Rose Connolly, Jane Slusser, Dominic Noble, Laura Runner, Zone One Librarian, Jennifer Fuss, Weirdly Beardly, Chris Bodley Dinch, Sunk Corgi, Sean McKenzie, Sonia Nero Perdo, Nathaniel Fronten, Hellscape Wanderer, Jolene Cassidy, Far Rangato. Ooh, they kind of rhymed. Transit Toronto. Haney Coke, Rain Corkin, Wendy's Abyssal, Ryan Hunter, Spencer Brownlee, John Weatherby, Damian Rice, W. Randy Eady, Sage Corbett, Tang Wilson, Wayne L., Belinda Walters, Nisa Marie. Hopefully I said that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Kilara Arell, Stephen Richardson, Zach Prax, Carry On, Drew Bach, Beatrix Purvis, Cyber Quicker, Jade Perissus, Kevin Frotek, Autumn Jenny, Maddie H., Matthew Correglo, Sean Piper, Sean Sullivan, Lysa Flynn. Epsilon is greater than the Mighty Ginger Joe, duh. Devin Camerlocker, Fine Kata Dragon, Melody Ann Winters Good, Mark H. Williams Author, Sally Leslie Hutchkins, Sarah Bystem, Casual Observer, Gretchen Badger, William Stewart, Marion Herb, Jordan Long, Katie K., Patricia Crompton, Michael and Kate Hawk. Blueberry Hill, Verdix Kai, Jess Johnson, Sarah Lemero, Sky Skinner, Joe Comics, Chris Hurst, Kefis Kaiser, Laura Demero, Kurt Mullen, Becky Sparks, Nathan Steele, Mick Sophus, Joe Heoresis, 
Josh just wants in blue. Celestial Dawn, Leotha Boyd, Troy Stull, Jason Knott, Zumila Kincaid, Jordy Lisero, Tony the DC Nerd, the Tipsy Changeling. Maeve, Luna T, Zophiel L, Grumpy Dragon 75, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, Crit Back, Strawberry Pup Trek, Kalis, Shield Maiden 4444, Fox E, Adam RDL Taylor, Kingy, Alexandra Lombach, It's a Bug, Not a Feature, Ulrich Bogdan, Barbara Borges, Abigail Marie, James Hodge, Corey and Vale, Honkinen. Mwah. Love you all. You're amazing. Take care of yourselves, my friends. You dorks.